We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. This is a Fed that really has been pushing back, particularly on the easing of financial market conditions. What the markets heard was this issue of the conflict between financial conditions easing and whether or not that would impact the Fed's policy making. If price inflation continues to come down as it has, it does open up a greater path to a soft landing. People forget that you can have a recession and while it's going on, you don't know you're in it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. You know, the studio floor is actually quite comfortable. It is. Two pillows yeah, and position them appropriately. Good. You can really make it work. You know, it's, it's the blow-up mat that really I like. We it's, never left. It's, it's, it's a second home. Maybe this is home. From New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures positive again, TK. What a rally post-Fed well, and throughout the whole of the news conference yesterday. Really, history made yesterday. I really, I really, John, think we need to stop and say, like, when I miss the data check mark there, you're going to the S&P and I'm like, what? And there it was, 20 minutes later, boom, up we go, boom, up we go again. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. And we go into huge news flow. How do you link the news flow of the coming two days to what we observed 245 yesterday? Powell will help have to face and face down and confront the data. That's the words of Andrew Hollenhorst, the city. The hopefulness will have to confront the economic data. I'd go one step further. There's a ton of research out there. A lot of people think the Fed is done now. Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley saying pause in March. And it's she's over. four and three quarters. Well, and take, sure. it, take it a step further. 50 basis points of rate cuts are being priced into the market by the end of this year. So yeah. not only is it done, but it's also preparing for the easing cycle. Did Jay Powell give enough uh, to really support this? And I think that, Tom, you raised a good point. How much of this is short covering? On the other hand, John, the move is undeniable and it eases financial conditions further. OK, so I spent a lot of time thinking about this. We all did. I didn't. Did he make a mistake? <laughs> did he make a mistake? Did he make a mistake and will he have to walk it back? He speaks next week with David Rubenstein at the Economic Club in New York. I believe it's next Tuesday. Did he make a mistake or did he mean it? Does he just not care that much about financial conditions? It was Greg Robb from Market Watch who asked the second to last question, the penultimate question in the news conference. It was the perfect question. It was about financial conditions and whether they're worried about it. And Chairman Powell said, I'd put it this way, it's something that we monitor carefully. Financial conditions didn't really change much from December and that meeting to now. And your reaction was everyone's reaction. It's just not true. You look at the data, he's just wrong. I mean, you're seeing bond yields down and you're seeing stock prices up. That is, by definition, an easing of financial conditions. So that is not true. On the other side, perhaps the you know, financial conditions didn't ease as much as it seems because he does see a deteriorating uh, uh, inflation picture as well as growth. The market's running in hard, Tom. Yeah, well, the markets, I think, John, in the data check, you've really got to look at the, the tech follows through, if you will, and we've got the tech derby uh, this afternoon. I believe there's two central banks that want to, you know, do a Powell Redux <laughs> the ECB today. And the BOE. It's a quiet date calendar for the next 48 hours. I'm not sure the guard wants to repeat that act in the news conference <clears throat> a little bit later. Looking at Meta, Facebook up more than 19% in the pre-market. It's the year of efficiency. We'll pick up on that in a moment. Equity futures on the S&P up four tenths of 1%, a lift off the back of some big gains yesterday. In a bond market unchanged after a big rally, the Treasury market yields lower. We go nowhere today, 342 on a 10 year. And Tom, going into the ECB, euro dollar, very close yeah. to 110. Yeah. Glad you go there. You go to euro dollar 110. I go to BBDXY, which is the great Bloomberg index. Breaking down to new dollar weakness, it's now, John, 11 big figures, 11% move, and the, and the dollar drawdown, if you will. That's a phrase I'm inventing this morning. Nice. Got copyright on it. It's great. <laughs> but I, I, I really would, would suggest, John, seriously, that the meta news is good. Is, you know, we can do it later in the break, but $40 billion share buyback? which we didn't expect from young Zuckerberg. Sure. Do you know what that interpolates, extrapolates out to with Apple? Go on. $330 billion. <laughs> <laughs> That's how big $40 billion is. We'll get Apple a little Zuckerberg. bit later. Elisa, we'll get numbers from the Federal Reserve. That's behind us, the ECB and the Bank of England in front of us. So yesterday might have been the day of 25. Today might be the day of 50, 50 basis points. That is the rate hike expected by both of the Bank of England as well as the European Central Bank. 7 a.m., we get that BOE uh, rate decision followed by a 7.30 a.m. news conference with Governor Andrew Bailey. Curious to see whether a hawkish tilt actually causes the pound to strengthen further or the opposite, right? At what point do we see this intersection?
intersection of rate hikes and potential growth trajectory kind of coming together with a message that has been for the most part positive for the pound so far this year versus the dollar but how much is this really a dollar weakening versus everything else and a risk on type of story 8 15 a.m. we get the ACB rate decision the expectation is for a 50 basis point rate hike right but what does Christine Lagarde say at 8 45 to me that really is the key to give a sense of how far they're willing to go where the balance of risks are will she be clearer than Jay Powell if she's talking about market conditions if she's talking about the concern about which the balance of risks weighs more heavily on will she come out and say we are worried about inflation period full stop and that might give a very different response to markets after the bell we do get Amazon Alphabet and Apple earnings we get a host of others as well but following on with what we saw from Meta a very different picture from Snap. Meta, the year of efficiency, how much is this just job cuts, being able to cull all the fat over the past decade? Chalk it up to its rough times, focus more on the message. How much is that going to cause the pop in these other big tech names? You're seeing Amazon shares up 4% pre-market following on to what we saw from Facebook. Google also up about 4% and Apple shares up about 1%, but building, yeah. John, on what we've already seen, which is a tremendous rally year to date. Moment of silence, John. What for? Dan Ives nailed it. Oh, sure, yeah. Dan Ives freaking nailed but it. But he got it pretty wrong nailed last it. year, didn't he? Yeah, he got the whole year wrong. We don't care about that. <laughs> but just here coming into earnings season, Ives was optimistic. And Who cranked the heat up in here? Yeah, it's a, well, it's a little hot. We slept here. It's I mean, the body warmth outside. all night. You know, I bought vet bill and kennel fee over, and, you know, it was a little warm in hey, here. Jack, it's off. It is hot. George Saravelos joins us now, yeah. global head of FX research at Deutsche Bank. George, let's start with the Fed yesterday before we move towards the ECB. What did you make of that performance in the news conference? Good morning, John. So I actually thought he did a pretty good job. Um, I, I'd make two points. The first one is he wasn't really dovish or hawkish. I thought he was agnostic. So he said, look, the market has a more dovish view on inflation. If the market is right then maybe we won't hike as much. And if we're right, we will end up hiking. Um, the key thing is if you look at real rates. So the real rate projection both the market and the Fed has is actually pretty similar. The difference is just on inflation. And I thought it was a, a pretty humble, so to speak, communication that mm. we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, and we'll do what the data tells us. George. Um, the second Sorry, go ahead. Well, George, I, I think it's just so important to get to the ramifications of this. If we had a disinflation press conference and if we break through some level, say 4 percent, what does that do to the dollar? It's got to be. Do we get the mother of all weak dollars if we get a true disinflationary outcome? Uh, absolutely. I, we've been bearish on the dollar since um, the end of last year, and I think the last bit that's missing is this so-called Fed pivot, the yield curve, to start um, steepening from, at the moment, it, it's very inverted levels. Uh, but, of course, it's not just about the Fed. It's also about what's going on in the rest of the world. Just one last point I wanted to make uh, on the Fed this year. Um, I think Kevin McCarthy is probably more important than Powell as far as the Fed easing cycle goes, and that's because of the debt ceiling. Now, when we look at the market pricing 50 basis points of rate cuts for this year, it's not just a view on inflation. It has to attach some probability to fiscal tightening. Because if you look at the last two big fiscal tightenings from the US, 95, 2011, around the debt ceiling, this could cause a recession. So all the market is doing is it's just applying some probability to fiscal tightening later this year. And that's why you're seeing these um, rate cuts being priced. I loved when uh, Jay Powell was asked about the debt ceiling yesterday, and he was just like, I really have no interest in talking about this, kind of like the rest of us, even though we have to live with it uh, for the rest of the year. George, I'm curious, pushing ahead until 7 a.m., when we do get the Bank of England rate decision, if they have a hawkish tilt with a 50 basis point rate hike, will that be good or bad, bad for the pound? So the key word with the Bank of England is this word forceful they've been using, which is to signal 50 bips increments. The question is whether they take that out or not. Our expectation is that they do. They signal um, the near end of the hiking cycle. I, I think if you look at sterling this year, the only reason it's been going up is because of a weaker dollar. Um, the euro has been outperforming. And the much more interesting question is how much more hawkish can the ECB be? And it's here where I think the ECB is at a very different place to the Fed in terms of the messaging and the need to keep financial conditions tight. So, George, what are you thinking here? 50 today from the ECB, another 50, another 50 after that? So I think it's useful to take a step back because ECB communication can be extremely noisy. But if you do, the European unemployment rate is at record lows. European core inflation is at record highs. 
equities are at record highs, wages are accelerating, growth is sequentially accelerating. I think even though the market is pricing a fairly hawkish ECB of around 3.4 uh, terminal rate, the risks are we go even higher. Um, even 4%, I think, is possible. Um, again, last year, it was extremely difficult to convince people European rates could go above 3%. And again, we're seeing the, the same concern around how high can uh, rates go. But I think the reality of the economy is actually very different and is supportive. Hey, George, ECB. we've got to leave it there, but great to catch up with you. As always, George Saravelos there of Deutsche Bank. I think we've said this a few times on this programme. I certainly didn't believe they'd get anywhere near 2% over at the ECB. But here we are, Tom, we're talking... Talking about the potential I'm, of three. I'm still not comfortable with it. It's going to be very interesting to watch today. And I wonder if she'll... I, frankly, I'll be honest, folks, other than McKee, Leesman, and the rest, the question quality yesterday, there were some questions. I'm like, what planet are these people <laughs> on? I'm not going to mince words. The ECB is a much better question quality. And I hope someone talks to Christine Lagarde about the nominal GDP overlay she has versus her monetary strategy. I always think the day after the Fed for us is pretty dangerous because none of us have slept. <laughs> So it's just letting... And we start to say what we well, really Lisa think. Well, Lisa was I know, snoring. Exactly. I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was my fault. Have you got any comments on the quality of the questions in the news conference it's yesterday? Not, I absolutely don't. You want to pivot on that point? Absolutely I like not. it when they follow up and they build on each other. I always appreciate I said, that. I said I one of the Sterling that. people in the in the meeting, not not McKee, I said, why don't you go for a third question? <laughs> Colby <laughs> yeah. over at the FT. Oh, Miss Smith, yes. I went. Colby I Smith's said, fantastic. I said, yeah, she's killing it. And I said to, to Colby, I said, ask a third question, be rude. And Colby asked the question about the balance of risks <clears throat> in the news right. conference. It was the right question to ask, I think. If you'd asked that question of Chairman Powell maybe three months ago, he would have just come straight out of the bat and just said straight out of the gate, this is it. The risk of doing too little outweighs the risk of doing too much. Nothing else matters. Then we got this sort of like umming, this ahhing. And you pointed this out several times yesterday, Lisa. Once yeah. the umming and ahhing starts, it's just like bye, bye, bye. <laughs> we're done here. Literally. The more humming and ahhing he does, the more people are like, yes. Can, we're can I suggest that someone that never looks at the minutes, maybe these minutes will be really interesting. Well, he promoted them. This time around. He promoted them when he was asked, did you he discuss got, the polls? He, 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 direct, he DM me on Twitter. Gonna, you think he's going to read them? I, I, no, Chairman Paul DM me. Two, two, two thirds of minutes. this committee will read the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us, several, several of us will. A couple yeah. of us might. In the next hour, Kit Jukes of Sock Chen. Equity futures up four tenths. The rally continues. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell promised that the central bank isn't done raising interest rates, but markets rallied anyway. Here's what investors chose to hear was Powell's message, a more upbeat outlook on inflation. Now, Powell said that policymakers see a couple more rate hikes before pausing. Not long from now, we'll hear from more central banks. The European Central Bank is set to raise interest rates another half point. Investors will be focused on clues about where borrowing costs are headed next. Meanwhile, the Bank of England is likely to deliver its 10th straight rate hike. It may also underscore the risk that inflation will become more persistent. Ukraine fears that a new Russian offensive is underway. According to The New York Times, Russia is assembling hundreds of thousands of troops in Ukraine. It's also stepped up artillery attacks. All this comes at a time when Ukrainian forces are waiting to receive tanks and other weapon systems from the U.S. and European allies. Shares of Facebook parent Meta are soaring today. CEO Mark Zuckerberg is striking a new tone with investors. He told them the social media giant will be leaner, more efficient, and more decisive with big assists from artificial intelligence. Meta posted fourth quarter revenue that beat expectations. And Deutsche Bank is promising to increase profit and revenue more this year. That's after the German lender snapped a long streak of market share gains in trading in the final quarter of a turnaround planned. Over the past four years, Deutsche Bank CEO Christian Saving cut thousands of jobs. He also relied heavily on his traders for profits. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. My role right now is to make sure we have a sensible, responsible ability 
to raise the debt ceiling, but not continue this runaway spending. This is a moment in time that for all American households, every family does this, every business does this, every state government, every county government. Kevin McCarthy there, the Speaker of the House, live from New York City. Good morning to you. The White House calling it a, quote, frank and straightforward dialogue, <laughs> saying it is their shared duty not to allow an unprecedented and economically catastrophic default. The American people expect Congress to meet it in the same way all of his predecessors have. It is not negotiable or, Tom, conditional. Tom Brady stopped by while they had the meeting. It wasn't reported, but there he was. <laughs> what, what is this? I mean, tell me here. It was, it, what, was there even a photo op? Was there... There was nothing. I knew this show would be off the rails today. <laughs> there was. I've got no idea well, what, what that is was. This? I, I what mean, are we talking about? Is this, this or Brady? I don't no, I'm talking about relation. Biden and McCarthy. Did I miss, did I miss I'm something? I'm talking about Biden and McCarthy. I mean, how odd a meeting. The sure. Speaker of the House, the President of the United States, should be a celebration. Did you see even the, if the, the wrong Klein exit? Did you see that exit? No, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. Brought up the fact that the president would be running. The president still hasn't announced. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> you know, look forward to being by your well, side yeah. in 24. We're, yeah. we're, we're going to continue. Whenever that happens. We're going to continue forward here. It's a hugely busy day for Bloomberg on radio and television. And, you know, when's Bank of England? 700, uh, uh, John? I, I believe so, yeah. So we're going to do that in 40 minutes or so. Right now we're going to digress. Emery Horton with us was something that maybe is lost in translation for our inter international audience. Is our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. I'm going to cut to the chase, Anne-Marie. It is branded as Stop Woke. And it's a Florida law. I believe it's called HB7, something uh, like that. It's got a name. And this is, of course, Governor DeSantis. <laughs> Can you explain what part of the Republican Party has figured out that education is the residence forward? Explain that story. Well, I think you saw that very much so with the Virginia governor who really leaned into uh, making sure that yeah. when it comes to education it's in schools that parents are really part of that conversation. And we saw Mr. Youngkin really lead the charge there, and obviously he won victory. And now you're seeing Governor DeSantis. He really leans into a, a lot of issues that strike a nerve within the Republican Party, the conservatives within a Republican Party. And this has to go with his Stop Woke Act um, that he's been trepiding for quite some time now and really sets him up to be the leader of 2024 in the sense that he has Trump-like <clears throat> policies, but many say his delivery, de delivery yeah. is a little bit more palatable. I'm ignorant of this, too, so help me out. What is the federalism of our education policy? Does Washington have a, vo a voice in what's riling up Republicans, or is it completely devolved to states and, local and, and localities? Well, if you think about it, a lot of what we have in education, there are federal mandates, but for the most part, it has to do with states. If you went to school in New York, you have the New York State Regents exams, and yeah, that I out. say this because that's where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but obviously, it's different state by state, but there are federal mandates on, on what students should be learning, but uh, states certainly have a lot of power. Right now, we are talking about the debt ceiling, whether we like it or not. And there's an issue of whether this does mean a lot of reduced fiscal stimulus, just or fiscal spending just in general, as well as a lack of a meeting of the minds. Have you been surprised or are people in Washington surprised that Kevin McCarthy has managed to stay in this position for as long as he has and continues to negotiate? <laughs> Well, there hasn't been a big vote yet, right, on the debt ceiling, and he only just had his first sit-down with the president. So they're trying to find common ground. I think many people understand that these two individuals are pretty pragmatic. They care about their future political careers, and both could be punished if there was a default in 2024, whether the Republican Party wants to consolidate power in Congress or this president. And J John mentioned what Ron Klain said yesterday. He didn't say if you run. He says when you run for 2024. So they both understand that they need to get an agreement. Um, but Kevin McCarthy, to your point, Lisa, is walking this tight line because he is beholden in some ways to the uh, ultra right of his party, who he was able to corral in the end to get elected speaker, but they have enough votes that if they don't like the negotiation tactics of the deal he's able to sh uh, strike with, with the White House and the Democrats, then they're going to vote that down. But we're just not there yet. It's very much so the beginning stages of these conversations. That's on the domestic front. What about internationally? Is there more of a meeting of the minds between Kevin McCarthy and the varied views that he represents and President Biden? 
I think when you look at things like China, uh, this Republican Party has set up a commission with a sole purpose to look at how to compete and how to really tame China and its influence on the United States. Items like these both agree on. When it comes to Ukraine, uh, potentially we are seeing a little bit of cracks. Uh, Kevin McCarthy was the first one that said there wouldn't be a blank check. So far, we haven't seen the Republicans stop any of the aid that's going, but that could potentially be an issue down the line. AMH, down in Washington. Anne-Marie, thank you. As always, the latest down in D.C. TK still <laughs> trying to work out when the president actually announces officially that he's running yeah, in 2024. I have no pearls of wisdom on this other than I go, what is he waiting for? I mean, I, I don't see what the downside is. but the Maybe wait for document and gate to get cleaned up. <laughs> Do we wait I, for that? That worked out yesterday. <laughs> it's, it's not yeah. helpful to make an announcement if your next house is being searched, is it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, do, no. why is everything gate? I don't understand why this sort of addition just let it go, to just sticking right. just let it go. on the end of things. I, I will say this. Maybe he's waiting for February 7th to roll around, the State of the Union. Maybe that'll be a good time yeah, for him I, to announce. Uh, yeah. The other theory that I have, and, you know, this isn't just mine, is he's looking to see how much traction former President Trump gets in the election to decide whether or not to run. Because it will matter how he uh, angles his run, depending on which Republican contender he's really facing off with. Interesting. I think some people might share that view, actually, Tom. I think so yeah are we done with that talk for 24 are we <laughs> <laughs> that was just absolutely can always talk about it. financial conditions in the fed again if you want we could do that all day well can we talk about uh, tech uh, <laughs> uh, think, but that's i think he was he a little miffed at the focus on financial conditions i mean the bloomberg financial condition we talked about it a week who's ever higher i don't but care if he's miffed about it that's what everyone was, wanted to hear about i, I was <laughs> some people tom say i would have lines. liked to have I, seen more discussion of as we disinflate, and Bloomberg had a wonderful banner up about that almost as a disinflation press conference, what does he do at 5% or 4% or 3%? What's this? What's the decision tree? And he alluded they're talking about it. I think he lent in, Tom. He did lean into this disinflationary trend that was starting to take yeah. hold. I thought what was interesting towards the end of the news conference is that he basically told you he wasn't here to change your mind about your own forecasts about where you think the economy is going. And that really spoke to this spread between the Fed and the market. Now, when we talk about the Fed and the market, I want to be much more specific than that. We're talking about the spread between the market and the median dot in the Fed's projections. Right. Because Chairman Powell, I'm not sure, reflected the median dot in the Fed's projections in yesterday's news conference. There are two ways to interpret, there are a lot of ways to interpret what happened yesterday, but there are two ways that I can think of. One, that Chair Jay Powell uh, actually just made a mistake and that this was a, mm. a faulty uh, policy meeting. The other way to interpret this is perhaps he's seeing data that shows a greater weakening than perhaps uh, he's letting on oh, in his rhetoric. special data, secret data. Well, not, not secret data, but that their interpretation of it is more in line with some of the more, you're laughing at me, but more of the like, you know, uh, potentially disinflationary views. I'll tell you why I'm laughing. Okay, we always do. talk about the Fed this way that they've got this secret pool of data. I, I know you're not doing that, but they've got this secret pool Maybe of data and they know things okay. that we don't Maybe know. Maybe I am suggesting think that. Think about how badly wrong their forecasts have been <clears throat> yes. in the last couple of years. Do you think they've got a secret pool of data and they know things that we don't? Somebody, and I don't have the note in front of me. <laughs> That's uh, a fair point. <laughs> I, I don't have the note in front of me. The nightlight wasn't bright enough when we were sleeping here. But uh, very importantly, somebody had a research note that alluded back to the early 1930s into 1954, which coming out of World War II, we went through two bouts of stunning disinflation down to deflation. We've had guests in this chair modeling sub-3%. CPI. Is anybody there yet? And maybe that's the beginning of what we saw I'll, I'll finish on this because we've got a long time this morning to talk about this. It is refreshing that he did just sit there and say, you're allowed to have your own forecast on things. I mean, isn't that the way it should be? But that's exactly right. I mean, honestly, shouldn't markets have their own opinion and not just be tied to the apron strings of the Fed? Let's get you some price action this Thursday morning. Equities higher. How many times have we said that in 2023? Up by a half of 1% on S&P 500 futures. Rallying again on the Nasdaq. Year to date, so this is before today's price action. This is a month and change. The Nasdaq 100 is up 13%. The S&P 500 is up a little more than 7%. 7.29% higher. This was meant to be the first half of the year was meant to be really terrible. Uh -huh. And the second half of the year was meant to be great. So, you know, make of that what you will. Maybe the second half of the year is just tremendous. 
Who knows? In a bond market, twos, tens and thirties looks like this. Your two-year yield shaping up as follows. We are at 4.1083. We had a break of 4.1% to the downside yesterday. Yeah. Big rally in Treasury yields, yields lower. We are down to about 3.4092 now. Tom, on a 10-year. I think the two-year yield there is really important in that it wasn't a breakdown for a cup of coffee. There was a sustained 4.09, even 4.08 going on there. And you really wonder, off the tech earnings today and off the central bank action, do we need to begin to frame a 3.99 two-year yield? How far do you want to take it? I did not think that 24 hours ago. What did ago. Dom Constam of Mizuho said? It was always, by definition, yeah. going to look like a soft landing before it looks like a hard landing. Just in the nature of yeah. the way the data comes through, the survey data first starts to look soft, the disinflationary trends, all that good stuff. Then we'll find out if it's going to be something worse than that. We're pricing in immaculate disinflation. We are pricing in an immaculate, soft landing experience that people say is nearly impossible. It is now the base case. And sure. so at what point are we looking at something that looks very fragile and easily disrupted? I'd go one step further. I think we've done more than that in the last couple of days. I think yesterday <clears throat> we priced out the Fed call. So for a long, long time over the last year or so, there was a belief in markets that the Fed put was gone and that if we rallied too far, the Fed needed to stamp down on that because we needed to keep financial conditions tight. The Fed call. That went yesterday. Chairman Powell was given the opportunity to execute. He didn't take it. So I think that the psychology around that story has shifted. To me, the big question is going to end up being whether or not stocks have actually priced in higher rates in a really meaningful way. That is one of the big divergences, right? Are we actually looking at a market that is truly a market again without the Fed's real thumb on it? Or are we looking at something that still is incredibly influenced by the Fed and perhaps in the wrong direction? It's going to be all about the data. Now, I know it sounds like Tom, but ultimately it is now, <laughs> isn't it? It's going to be about yeah. the incoming information. It's going to be about payrolls. It will be about CPI. February 14th, Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, all CPI. that good stuff. Yeah. Tottenham, AC Milan as well. Yeah, February 14th, very Tom. Very important That's the important stuff. AC Never mind. Milan is how much are tickets? They, they lost 42 games <laughs> that, in January. That club, honestly, right now. Anyway, I digress. Can we bring up Meta? <laughs> Meta absolutely flying in the pre-market after a revenue beat just yesterday. The stock is up by more than 19%, but it's all about the comms coming out of the C-suite. Mark Zuckerberg calling 2023 the year of efficiency, saying the following, we're working on flattening our org structure and removing some layers of middle management to make decisions faster, as well as deploying <coughs> AI tools to help our engineers be more productive. There's going to be some more that we can do to improve our pro productivity, speed, Tom, and ultimately, and this is what we're rallying on, cost structure. In the heart of earnings season, we're going to dive into tech technology right now. We do this with earnings coming out. We'll get to it in a bit here on Merck Honeywell. And I noticed Snap-on doing better than Snap yesterday. But now on technology, we are so advantaged by Anurag Rana and Mandeep Singh. They're with Bloomberg Intelligence and have world-class knowledge here. Anurag, I want to start with you. There is this thing out there that the state of big tech of America is at minimum on pause, if not seen better days in the past. You aggressively push against that. What is the American tech superiority right now? It is the only, uh, I would say, the superiority of the United States over the rest of the world, and I do not see any reason that will change over time. The question <clears> is, what do you pay for those stocks? And that's dictated by the tenure, frankly. And that's, what, that's the fight we are having. One thing we have seen with these layoffs is, eventually, the margins for these companies are going to be far better right. in the long run. The question is, how, do you, how, how long do you wait for that? Well, well, this is really important. What is your terminal value study? Have you... Your, your view out of what to do with Alphabet, what to do with Apple, are you going out to a longer terminal value now or have you brought it in with the new angst? See, for me, it's always been the long term. But what happens is, you know, companies like Microsoft or Apple, one percentage points of move here and there and the stock falls down, you know, 10, 5, 10 percent. And I think that's where a lot of the things is people are very focused on the short term. They're not looking at the long term viability of these business models. They're not all cutting. Apple hasn't cut in a big way. Do you expect it to stay that way? See, once again, they didn't expand as much. But having said that, you know, anybody can cut 3-4% of the workforce to, you know, either get rid of the, the lower performers or trim a little bit of fat. 
to me, that's really not a big cut. And I, I, you know, it's possible they do it today, but they didn't expand as much as either, uh, you know, Microsoft or Salesforce did during the pandemic. So let's try to dig within the tea leaves that we have in Mandy. But I'd love to bring you in to talk a little bit about what we saw with Meta and what could be applicable to what we see today after the bell with Alphabet, Amazon, and Apple. What are the themes? Is it cost cutting is going to be rewarded? Is it streamlining the vision, or is it that advertising is more resilient than people had thought? Well, so I think cost cutting will certainly be a theme. You saw that with uh, Meta last night. Not only did they cut OPEX, they also cut back their CapEx. And I think that is something that is a near-term positive, but for a company like Meta that is trying to pivot to the next version of their product, whether it's Metaverse or something else, cutting back CapEx isn't great for the long term, but the market clearly appreciates you know, a discipline that the new CFO is showing. I think in terms of what Alphabet may say, the fact that they are more diversified on the top line should help, you know, soothe concerns around the viability of, you know, them compounding their top line uh, at least, you know, 10, 12% for the next two, three years. In the case of Meta, I don't think ad spending is coming back at least in the next two, three quarters. So their top line will continue to be muted. It's all about cost cuts and the you know discipline they can show in terms of bringing bringing back their free cash flow. So, Mandeep, does this uh, is this justifying the move that we're seeing in the stock? The fact that it's almost doubled since November third of last year. That basically, if you cut all the fat build up over the past ten years, particularly over the past three, that's enough to justify pretty high flying valuations. Well, look at, uh, you know, how much of the bad news was already discounted. This stock went down almost 70%. So even if it's up, you know, 80, 70, 80% this year, it still doesn't make up for the losses. And in my mind, I think the real concern is around the top line. What could go in their favor is a TikTok ban, clearly, or WhatsApp monetization. They talked about, you know, click to messaging ads being a $10 billion run rate. If they can layer on e-commerce and payments to WhatsApp, right. That could be the growth driver, but otherwise it's still a one product company. It's relying yeah. heavily on digital ads. I borrowed Anurag Rana's HP 12C this morning and interpolated the extrapolation of a 40 gazillion dollar share buyback at Meta. For Apple, that's a $300 billion plus equivalent C. Is that the, is that the secret weapon profit making big tech has? Is when, the te time, when it gets tense like this, boy, can they deploy cash to shareholders. Yeah, I, I'm actually surprised that Microsoft didn't buy back more shares. I'm really? Re yeah, I'm, really? Uh, yeah, I am really looking forward to Apple making a statement, uh, buying back more shares. Thank and saying, you. I, I really am surprised that, uh, you know, we, we, we're going to publish a note today that says uh, we want Apple to actually increase their buyback by 20%. Their dividend, we want them to have a higher dividend so they can be part of the Dow Jones industrial average? I'm more, I'm more keen on the on the buybacks given the valuation. So is given, John Farrell. Uh, and, uh, you know, the free cash flow is very large. <laughs> Apple's going to generate about $100 billion in free cash flow this year, and I think they should spend all of it, if not a little bit more. Just and they're going to be clear, far the, off from being cash split, neutral. Perhaps you get that done, Tom. You just yeah. need a smaller price. That's how the Dow works. Just get a lower price. They're going to develop a hundred billion free cash flows. You is guys Tim, have to sleep is Tim Cook CEO of the night. pandemic? <laughs> Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I mean, I, th I think Apple did well, but it didn't do as well as some of the other companies. Amazon, I think, did far better than Come that. Come on, the stock tanked. People got killed there. Bezos was thrown out. I, yeah, you're, you're looking at the eyes of the stock. I'm looking at the side of the, the moat of Amazon is far stronger today than it was pre-pandemic. And that, to me, is far more important. Talk to me about how well Tim Cook seems to navigate Washington, D.C. in a way that other tech companies just cannot. It's amazing to me that it, they're able to have these margins. They're able to have buybacks this big. They're able to assemble the iPhone, <clears throat> this fantastic product overseas in China, and they barely ever get any political pushback. Why? Uh, it's not even, I would say, he, he can navigate not even Washington, but China better than anybody else. It's, it's amazing he to has, see. He has not been touched. But having said that, he has to diversify away from China. It's just, the, you know, it's this common sense. He needs to do that. And I think we are already seeing the, the rumblings of it. It's going to take time. But I do see over the next few years a lot more diversification of the supply chain outside China. And that's what we've seen pretty consistently, Mandeep. I just want to really wrap up with this idea of layoffs and where they're really being focused. Focused. Is this just fat that has been developed, or is this artificial intelligence chat GPT coming for our jobs? I mean, I, I think I'll give Elon Musk a little bit of credit here in terms of showing how you could just cut 
you know, employees and the service is up, uh, you know, Twitter app is up. And that's the model I feel every tech company is trying to emulate in terms of, okay, era of efficiency. I think that's where it's coming from. Chat GPT, I, I don't think it's going to be that profound in terms of impact on the number of people these companies have. So uh, time will tell. But I, I think this is more about a near-term phenomenon. Hey, Mandeep, this was great. Mandeep Singh, thank you, sir. And to Agarag Rana, who actually came to work today. And we appreciate oh, no, this. No, that, no, no, you're wrong on that. They I'm just can't be, No, John, they can't be in the... They're so valuable, they can't be together in the same building. That's, is that right? Yeah, it's a That's policy. Right. As opposed Paul to Sweeney us. Paul Sweeney put that in. <laughs> We're oh, not valuable. Care about exactly. us. We're like, but, but no, Rana and, and, and Singh can't be in the same building at the same time. Anyway, this was great. Issue. Thank you. Big, big, big day. You're going to do this the again, right? later. I'm sure he will. He loves it. Meta <laughs> gave you death stare. Meta up by 19% in the pre-market. What a run on top of the gain year to date of what? 27%. Yeah, so over far. the last month or so. It's more than 60% since the uh, low on November 3rd wow. for the stock. Just to give you a sense. Well, it's a low bar return. because we thought Mark Zuckerberg had lost his mind, right? And he was throwing all this money at the metaverse and renamed the company. Right. And we thought maybe he'd stick with it. So getting rid of middle management is enough for everybody to come flooding back. He's saying did, the right things. The Let's put it that way. You know, we <laughs> I didn't guess ask. So. Anurag or Mandeep, it maybe it's a Mandeep question. Did the metaverse die yesterday? I, 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 I think don't know. he did his conference, his investor conference in the metaverse. I saw an avatar that he uh, had oh, created. So, but yeah, I think that the the focus is on the one product. But then this really raises an existential question: What happens if people stop using Instagram? I, you know, I love our guests, but I'd love to go back and do a chronological sot string of everyone's gloom. I'll let. You pick the week well, on Apple. the autumn. On everything. Right. Just, it, you know, it's it's just stunning where we are after yesterday. You just stunning. want cuts of Lisa. <laughs> I feel well, no, we could do that, but that's easy. We do that Everything's every going away. The VIX is 17.60. Yeah, Who I know. Predicted I'm shedding a tear. It's really bullish stuff. Equity futures <laughs> on the S&P <laughs> up a half of 1%. Jennifer McKeown, the chief global economist at Capital Economics and former BOE economist joining us ahead of that Bank of England rate decision. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo markets rallied after the fed raised interest rates by a quarter point now that's despite fed chair jerome powell warning that further rate hikes lie ahead still he acknowledged that the u.s economy is in an era of disinflation with price pressures cooling house speaker kevin mccarthy called it a good first meeting after his one-on-one -on -one with president biden on the debt limit Still, expectations are low for anything happening quickly. The president has resisted tying spending talks to raising the debt ceiling. Meanwhile, Republicans want steep budget cuts. North Korea has shut the door on talks with the U.S. over its nuclear arsenal. Kim Jong-un's foreign ministry also pledged to respond to what it sees as threats from the U.S. After firing off a record number of ballistic missiles last year, North Korea has been relatively quiet to start 2023. It's only tested one missile so far. Israeli warplanes bombed parts of the Gaza Strip early today. Officials described the targets as a chemical plant and a weapons manufacturing site for Hamas, which Israel describes as a terrorist organization. That comes after a month of bloody clashes between Israelis and Palestinians. And it's one of the biggest wipeouts in history. Go to Madani's businesses have lost $108 billion in a week after allegations of fraud by Hindenburg Research. The downfall also forced him to pull a $2.4 billion share to share sales to protect investors. Madani's company denies the claims. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The UK economy has been hit by a big rise in energy prices that's squeezing household incomes. The effects of that are coming through. Also a uh, squeeze on company profits, many firms facing large cost pressures. The effects of that, plus the monetary tightening, is likely to cause the economy to go into recession during this year. Great to hear from Michael Saunders there, the former Bank of England monetary policy member and Oxford Economics senior policy advisor. I'll tell you a story about Michael Saunders. Please. Governor Carney 
takes over the job at the Bank of England and Governor Carney goes up to the north of the country. I think he went up to Nottingham or something like that and he did this north. speech. And he was meant to speak to a series of local businesses. And Michael Saunders at the time was at a bank it's down in the city of London and Michael travelled up, sat in the audience, put his, put his hand up and actually got to ask a question. Carney spotted him. Then years later, where does he end up? <laughs> it's up <laughs> That's at the amazing. Bank of England. Isn't that a great Michael Saunders story? I remember it at the time and I, I laughed. I remember watching that speech of Carney at the time and just could not stop laughing. This is what some of these economists do. You know, they sort of infiltrate the conferences they're not meant to be at and try and answer, ask questions. My favourite is what they wear to be incognito. They dress like Tom <laughs> Keene. They put on like a hat, oh, like I, a, you know, Clouseau outfit. I have a great Mervyn King story, but we won't say it right now. I'll tell it sometime here. As we, okay, we can't wait to that. that. <laughs> no, it's really, really Stay funny. Stay tuned. It Mystery story. The, it, I've got anyways. a good Mervyn one too, but yeah, you know, maybe, I maybe know. we'll save that for the campfire one day. Yeah, you know? well, we'll have to see. <laughs> Uh, this is really important. We're coming up here on the Bank of England. I'm going to have John bring in our esteemed guest. Other than to say, Capital Economics does terrific, thoughtful research. They go deeper, and it's always been a joy, really, from day one. And, John, to me, what the backdrop here is when you speak to Jennifer McCown, their, their chief global economist, you have to ask her, did you take the train today? Or do we because need to ask strikes. Governor Bailey? How did you get to work today, Governor Bailey? He lives on Threadneedle it's a, Street. It's, this is not like the presser yesterday. The Bank of England is a, an, a central bank with a labor crisis of some sort that others don't face. I think Chairman Powell talked about two-sided risks, or at least reflected on two-sided <clears> risks. <throat> yeah. I think there's multiple risks in the UK right now. Jennifer McKeown joins us. Jennifer, fantastic to catch up with you. Can you tell us these multiple risks that this governor of this Bank of England has to face down today and ultimately what they'll decide to do? Yeah, that's that's right. And um, what, what's really interesting about these these strikes, we've had uh, nurses strikes, teachers strikes, rail strikes, is that on the one hand, they're, they're weighing on activity. So, that, so they make the near-term outlook for the UK economy look even worse. But on the other hand, they're further evidence of the tightness of labour markets in the UK, this real push for, for stronger wage growth. And I think now labour markets feel tighter than they are in the US. So that the Bank of England's really got a bit of a, a, a dilemma on its hands. We think it's going to go for another 50 um, today, but the, the peak right. might not be too far off, given just how, how weak the economy looks. Jennifer, what is business investment in the United Kingdom, all the, not Brexit gloom articles, but the tone that I get out of the United Kingdom, if you're not 47 blocks outside London, is there's a dearth of business investment. Is that true? Um, yeah, well, definitely business investment ha has been weak in, in the UK. That partly relates to Brexit, but of course it relates to all sorts of headwinds the UK economy has been facing, including the surging gas prices, the, the energy crisis here. So um, th there are a lot of good reasons um, to, to hold back on investment. And with interest rates rising, that obviously just, just adds to those. And that's something businesses are, are, are very much aware of. So the bank's got to be got a, a really careful tightrope to walk here where it, it indicates right. That it is on top of inflation, but that rates aren't going to go sky high and stem any investment that may have right. been forthcoming. Jennifer, explain to our audience the Bailey-Powell distinction and that Governor Bailey has to worry about a floating rate financial structure in the United Kingdom where rates move around with inflation much more rapidly than they do in the United States. How does that constrain him and the Bank of England? Yeah, that's true. And historically, for the UK, most mortgages in particular have been at variable interest rates. So UK households have very quickly felt the effects of um, higher interest rates. And there's been a real risk of housing slumps. Now, that has changed a bit in the UK. We've shifted more towards kind of two-year fixes, but that, that's still not as long as, as the situation in the US where, where mortgages in particular tend to be on longer fixes. The pass-through from interest rates is maybe a bit slower. So it's so the bank's also very much got the housing market on its mind. House prices are already falling here. So it's going to need to be um, very much aware of how its policy is affecting um, people's interest rate costs and, and knocking onto the housing market. Jennifer, I remember about six months ago when we were talking about how all central banks were hiking into weakness. And now it seems like the U.S. is pausing into strength. The ECB is hiking into more strength. And the Bank of England is very alone hiking into true weakness, even with the IMF predicting uh, an ongoing a recession and deepening there. How does that complicate how far they can raise rates considering that inflation has continued to surprise to the upside? 
Uh, yeah, it, it definitely complicates the story further. The picture in the UK is much more clearly one one of a, a weak economy, an economy that, that's heading into or indeed already in recession. Um, but I don't think that's far off in the US or the Eurozone either, to, to be honest. I think that there are plenty of indications that the US economy will still suffer a recession. And I think the Eurozone has had a temporary reprieve. Yes, the Q4 figures were a bit better than we might have thought. But I think just given the extent of the squeeze on real income, comes from the from the energy crisis that we've had and the policy tightening we've already had a recession is coming in the eurozone too so i think all central banks are going to be in a similar position key issue of course is the extent to which price pressures are are coming off and it's much clearer that that's happening in the us than it is in either the eurozone or in the uk do you think that economists including at the bank of england are overestimating or underestimating how deep the recession in britain will be um, well, the, the Bank of England's forecasts have been very pessimistic um, until recently. It had a recession lasting about eight quarters, um, encompassing, I think, a 3% peak to trough fall in GDP. I don't think it's going to be quite that bad. And indeed, its forecast will probably show that. Uh, its new set of forecasts will probably show that the recession is going to be shallower than previously feared, partly because the data we've had haven't been quite so awful as we thought they might be, but also because markets are now pricing in a much lower path for interest rates than, than they were, given that the Bank of England's forecasts are predicated on market interest rates, that, that will have a big bearing on where it sees the economy going. So I, th I think we might see some relief um, in in those terms. And, and perhaps the ECB's forecasts look relatively gloomy now, given, given the data that, that we've had. Jennifer, wonderful to get your insight, as always. Mm -hmm. Jennifer McKeown there of Capital Economics, Tom, the decision <clears throat> from the BOE seven minutes away. Give us your perspective on this. I mean, your dinner alone that you had in Mayfair is going to keep the UK out of recession. We understand it. It moves the GDP needle. But John, you were there in the Lisa's wonderful question. I just, all I'm seeing is gloom, gloom, gloom. Oh, sure. it's not as bad as we thought. And I believe I just heard that from the capital economics. You say that I was there. So let's talk about where I was. I was commuting between a hotel and going into the office. I've not seen the rest of the country. I've not experienced what people are going so through right now. So that's all I do when I, I talk like I'm an authority. <laughs> and we can joke about it, but ultimately we're all on the same page. Yeah. There's a lot of people really struggling right now in the UK to pay their energy bills. There is a real fear that once those two-year fixed mortgages, if you've got a two-year fix, once you have to remortgage and you're looking at, what, 4% bank rate at the Bank of England, maybe in about five minutes, that's a real problem for a lot of people. So somebody's got like a two or three percent mortgage rate, and it becomes five percent. Is that could, could rough be, math? Could be lower than that, Tom. I'm not sure what they negotiated at the time or how long the fix was, but sure. I think the difference here, and Jennifer was talking about it, and you alluded to it, is that the floating rate mortgage, the available rate yeah. mortgage, tracks bank rate and not the market. And bank rate is what the Bank of England decides rates actually is, and that's where you get your adjustment. The other issue, and Jennifer also touched on this as well, is the proportion of the gilt market which is indexed to inflation. So that's actually got a little bit better over the last couple of months, the fact that we're not facing down <coughs> the forecast for inflation in the UK. Yeah. Some banks were talking up maybe close to 20%. So right. we can talk about good versus bad. It's not good, but it's certainly better than it was a few a few months ago. The tail risk, though, here is the energy prices. And I don't mean to be misgloom. And honestly, it's really wonderful to see that the economic data is coming in stronger than a lot of people expected. But if there is a colder bout, not just, you know, for a couple of days, if there is a bigger disruption, does that change the whole narrative around this optimism? Tom? I, I, I'm waiting for John to answer because I think he's got a really special thing. John, what's so important here, and I've actually had the honor of talking to Governor Carney about this. There's London, which is our perception, and there's everything else. And the everything else is not is, – is really – there's a real distinction. I feel John, like I'm doing there. Governor Carney's greatest hits, but there was a news conference, I think maybe 2014 – and there was, a, there was a problem with house prices in London. They were absolutely surging by 20 yeah. 30%. And Governor Carney had this great line. And if you understand or are familiar with the tube system in, in the city of London, he said, I don't set policy for inside the circle line. And the circle line <laughs> just goes around the centre of London. And that was his message. I don't set policy John. for inside the circle line. Isn't that a great line? One day I got in the circle line. He just went round. <laughs> I went all the way around. <laughs> I can imagine that. <laughs> Kit Juice and Sock Gen coming up. A Bank of England rate decision up next.
We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. This is a Fed that really has been pushing back, particularly on the easing of financial market conditions. What the markets heard was this issue of the conflict between financial conditions easing and whether or not that would impact the Fed's policy making. If price inflation continues to come down as it has, it does open up a greater path to a soft landing. People forget that you can have a recession and while it's going on, you don't know you're in it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. This show is such a mess this morning. Someone flew Guy in. <laughs> said, please, I'm HR. Dying. HR called up and said, please. <laughs> On Boeing's last 747. I thought that was really <laughs> special. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Guy Johnson alongside us here in New York as the Bank of England makes the decision, Guy, to hike interest rates once more. 50 basis points. And that sounds, that the statement... The, the commentary feels much more hawkish than I think a lot of people yeah. are anticipating. A lot more hawkish. So they've gone by 50. They're saying inflation risks skewed significantly to the upside. Um, they're saying that they're going to require further tightening. The expectation was potentially we could get 50 and maybe 25 after that. Right. I, further tightening, maybe you could still put 25 in there, but this sounds more hawkish to me. Pounds gaining on the back of it. And one question I, know, I want John to do the markets because the screen's lighting up like a candle. As simple as this, it's assumed, Guy Johnson, that the Fed speakers will walk back some of the tone that we saw from Chairman Powell. Yep. In the United Kingdom, do the various people of the Bank of England walk back what the governor may say today or what this statement says? OK, so the, the vote split 7-2. So remember, it I was, that, it was a three-way split last Arr, time. Two. You're wrong, <laughs> Bailey. Did you just bark? Yes. I think he did. I love it. It sounded like it, didn't it? I think he's implying that I barked, though. It's like I think Game of Thrones. I love the dissent. We would never do this with the Fed. The disrespect. <laughs> Carry on, Guy. 7-2. Um, so I'm assuming that you've got Tenre and Dingra still voting for 25... Uh, sorry, they're unchanged. Actually, it's a 7-2, so maybe they voted for 25. No, they both went the, unchanged, guys. They both went unchanged. Yeah. OK. So that means man's come down... To 50, to from 50, 75, yeah. To a 75. So it feels more of a coalesced uh, uh, Bank of England... But it still feels slightly more hawkish than I think than I think we were anticipating. Guy, talk to us about the data, the backdrop for the data in the UK right now. Talk to us about what the United Kingdom and this Bank of England is confronting and the difference maybe between the UK and what's happening here in the States. Well, I think there are similarities, so let's actually start there. I think it's about the labour market. I think that is where the ultimate problem lies for the Bank of England. You've got a whole load of people that are over the age of 50 that have left the labour market and don't want to come back. Uh, you've got a very, very tight labour market as a result of that. And that is, I think, probably one of the primary focuses of the Bank of England right now. They are talking about a shorter, shallower recession than the November outlook. So you would, if, if you're getting a shorter, shallower recession, that means in theory you're getting more demand, right? So that's going to, in theory, push the inflation a little harder than you originally would have got with that deeper recession, which would have curtailed the inflation. So in some ways, there's more of a demand push, sort of demand pull story here within the inflation outlook. So yeah, I think this this sounds like this is a Bank of England that that wants to do more, needs to do more, certainly judging by the by the numbers that they're pushing out today. How much were they basically given a bit of a pass to do this because of energy prices, because of China reopening? And I say that because everyone seems to suggest a shorter and shallower recession, and a lot of it hinges on those two factors. I, I think energy, yes, China less so. I think China's a bigger factor for the ECB. I think it's less of a factor for the Bank of England, um, only because it, we're not uh, the kind of industrialised economy that, that Germany and, and, and its hinterland uh, represents. Uh, but I think the Bank of England, uh, but I think the Bank of England will have looked at the energy story. But the energy story again is it's going to allow people to spend more, Lisa, and and that in theory should be pushing the inflation narrative a little bit harder. So it brings down headline inflation, but does it encourage core inflation to stay maybe a little bit stickier? So we were talking about dovish versus hawkish. It's very hard. Those words are kind of losing meaning at a certain point. Yeah. We're parsing through uh, throughout uh, all of the minutia. The pound was briefly gaining, then it was losing, then yeah. it was gaining. I mean, it's really fluctuating now. It's a little bit down versus the dollar. Yeah. Catherine Mann, how much yeah. does she hold the keys to the interpretation, the fact that she dropped her vote down from 75 basis points to 50 with the, most, uh, the core of the group? Well, I think she's just she's signaling a reality of an economy slowing down. Um, and I think that just is the practicality of the situation. They have dropped a bit of language out of the statement, it looks like. It looks like they have dropped forcibly, 
which the market was paying attention to in terms of the way that we should interpret what they've said today. So in terms of in terms of how the language is changing around this and, and the interpretation they're trying to put on it, they have taken down the emphasis on the need to hike a little bit further. So there's, I, I started off saying this was this felt a little bit more hawkish than anticipated. The fact that they've dropped forcefully maybe just detracts a little bit from that. But I think Man is interesting. I think she's just reflecting reality. She was at one tail. She's now coming back into the consensus. But the consensus that the core of the group is still around 50. You've only got two yeah. on, on two outliers at the moment. The nominal GDP story, there's an assumption of the ECB coming up that they don't have the power, the economic power for a higher rate regime. Some agree, some yep. disagree. In the United Kingdom, is the oomph there no. as a total country to withstand these rates? Well, John was, put it, John was talking through the impact on the mortgage market. It, it is going to have a significant impact, but it is going to be offset by lower energy costs. And it's going to be interesting to see what wages look like. So there's, there's, there's a kind of balancing factor that could come through here. And I think the bank's yeah. going to be watching wage growth. But at the moment, you've got a real income squeeze. Yeah. Um, so people are, are going to be hit by these higher costs. Um, but in some ways, that's what you need. Um, that, that's the objective here. You have a relatively fast transmission through the mortgage <coughs> market into the real economy. We should do this every month, Guy. This was great. Fly him in. On a, on a Boeing 747. Sure. And Tom Barks. You know. and, and was that, that was a, new for me. That was a growl? Or that, a was a <laughs> that was a descent. That was a descent. That was a descent. Yeah, I'm sitting okay. at home and, you know, cash flow wants to do something. Like, Argh, you know. Oh, you growl at your own dogs. Like, and my children. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the dogs don't growl. It's Tom. It's only 7.06 here in New York. I have no idea how we're getting through to... Guy the ECB news conference at 8.45. The news conference begins with Governor Bailey and when? Guy, 23 minutes. minutes. Well, yeah, yeah, 25 minutes. Like that. All right. Kit Jukes joins us now, Chief FX Strategist at SOCGEN. Kit, wonderful to have you with us. Your response to that decision this morning from the BOE? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not a massive surprise. They were expected to go 50. We're looking for another 50 after that. I'm not sure we're going to change our minds in terms of what comes next. Um, it does sound a little bit more upbeat, but... You know, one of the big surprises at the back end of last year, not just in the UK, but right the way across Europe, uh, was that when energy subsidies came in, people didn't move their growth forecasts up. The consumer got protected from the worst of the energy crisis. We get bigger deficits, bigger trade deficit in the UK, um, but, uh, but more GDP temporarily. Uh, coming into this year, I mean, the biggest surprise to me of all is, is how well European industry is doing at weaning itself off gas uh, and how that relieves the pressure around Europe from the energy crisis. Um, and it, it probably means the UK has a longer but shallower recession um, than, uh, than anyone else. Uh, but, uh, you know, where does that leave the, the Bank of England? Still with more to do, yes, but still with a recession. Uh, um, and maybe the only thing for the currency that's important is um, that everyone is so bearish that it has a cushion. So meanwhile, in the U.S., we're talking about long and variable lags. When it comes to the United Kingdom, when will the full uh, thrust of what we've seen with rate hikes hit the economy in a way that hasn't yet fully been seen? Um, it feeds through. It feeds through faster than, than other countries because we've got a floating rate mortgage market, as you discussed. I think there's no doubt about that. It feeds through to currency quite quickly, which, which has an impact on other things, uh, some good, some bad. Uh, but for the rest of it, we have the same fundamental issue. I think Guy mentioned it, as you have in the United States. If your labor market is so tight that there are more jobs for people available than there are people looking for them, your economy can't fall right off the edge of a cliff just like that. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's the combination of a rising mortgage rate and losing your job that people of my generation can remember from the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 1990s as being utterly devastating. Uh, we're going to have half of that for people, albeit at lower mortgage rates. It's when the labour market breaks that we really, really struggle. So, so far, right. that's not what's happening. Kit Jukes, the velocity of what we observed yesterday, just simply your thoughts on the moment of 2.45 p.m. yesterday, Wall Street time, when markets seized and moved? Uh, to, to my mind, you know, that we could talk about it a lot, but the... the um, I was surprised at the scale of the reaction to a Fed decision that was so close to expected uh, as makes no odds. You know, the, the minor tone that Chair Powell didn't push back aggressively at, uh, at some of the questions about sort of, you know, uh, sort of dovish bias questions about whether the labor market is going to be mm -hmm. okay with wage growth easing <clears throat> off even at low unemployment. Um, the market really sort of grabbed hold of all that. So it seemed quite euphoric to me. So right. you know, we spent, the, you know, after that. But 
um, the, the, the decision itself wasn't a big surprise. But no matter the ebb and flow, BBDXY is down 11 percent. We've got weak dollar down 11 percent from its peak, the drawdown, if you will, folks, from the strong dollar moment that Kitschuk's nailed. He nailed that call. Does this signal today a renewed confidence in you of a weaker dollar? Um, no. I mean, yes, I'm still confident. Look, that the dollar reached levels it hadn't seen since 1985. If you'd asked me in 95, 05, 15, whether we'd get back to 1985 levels, I'd have said, you know, we're not going to do Star Wars, Reagan, Volcker again. It's not going to happen. So it's coming from a great height. I think it's got further to fall. I think February uh, is, is where we're supposed to pause. The big things that drove it, the peak in long-term real interest rates in the United States, the, the good news in Europe on the energy crisis, the, uh, the Japanese pivot uh, and the China reopening, they're all sort of in the price. So we're, we're sitting here waiting saying, what's the next big dollar driver from here? And I'm not sure that yesterday's FOMC was. So um, I, I think it's going to pause for February and then weaken again after that. How will the tone of the ECB press conference and the ECB statement differ from what we saw from the Bank of England and even more extremely from the Federal Reserve yesterday? I think it's bound to be um, hawkish, uh, focused on inflation. The ECB has an inflation mandate, uh, and I think it's likely to reinforce that pretty clearly. Uh, you know, they, they are still worried about inflation at this point in time. They think they need the economy to slow. They think they need the labor market to ease up. Uh, they, you know, they don't have as weak an economy as the UK, and they do have, uh, and they do have an inflation problem that's not quite as big, but is bigger than the ECB can cope with. So I think it's going to be pretty straightforwardly hawkish coming from Christine Lagarde without too much messing around, laying out the details or more details of the plans for quantitative tightening, things like that. Uh, this is a, you know, this is a central bank with a with a rule book. Uh, in, in a you know run by a French lawyer with a rule with a reputation <laughs> with, with who obeys rules, uh, and that that'll that'll get them focused on that. So I expect them to be chief hawks. The juicy and snark there was know. it was legendary. We'll hear from the lawyer in about ninety five minutes. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Okay. Can we speak about this lawyer, Chairman Powell? He's going to be interviewed by David Rimstein at the Economic Club of Washington next week. Just to finish on this, what do you expect to hear from him? Some pushback on that interpretation of what I think he was probably felt pushed uh, in, 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 the, in the press conference about various things people had said. You know, his, his defense was to say, you'll see our new forecasts next month because we don't have any. We don't have a new dot plot. This is where we are. Uh, you know, and I think, I think he has a chance to prep himself to try to talk the market back a little bit to where the dot plot was or, or you know, to talk, to talk away the idea that they'll be cutting before Christmas again. But, but that's the most that's likely. Hey, Kit, great to catch up with you. As always, Kit Jukes there of SOCGEN. After the Bank of England hikes interest rates 50 basis points, in about an hour from now, we'll hear from the ECB, also expected to be hiking 50 basis points. In about 15, 16, 17 minutes, yeah. you'll hear from Governor Bailey at the Bank of England. We won't take that. We'll be bringing some of the headlines on TV and radio. We will be taking the news conference with President Lagarde Tom a little bit later this morning. Dumb question, oh, wise one. Do they dissent at the ECB? Do they, do they have... Do so they it's a little bit more interesting. Voted? It's not as transparent. Aaron, but you will get a question in the news conference because, as you've pointed out, the ECB journalists do their job, Tom. And in that news conference, they will ask, was this decision today unanimous? And you'll get some clarity as to whether it was. And then a couple of minutes later, and sometimes in the news conference, you'll get a news report from sources yeah, yeah. saying whether they were happy with the decision or not. So this one plays out a little bit differently in Europe. Usually those sources say, no, they were really miserable and it was terrible and she didn't reflect it at all. And then the next day she comes out and walks it back as well. So, you know, perhaps we'll see the same uh, playbook there. But I do wonder whether Jay Powell is going to really push back. I think he risks credibility if he comes out and just says, you guys hash it out, cats in a bag, go for it. You've got a decision to make. We've talked about it. Either he wasn't very good at his job yesterday and he messed up and he's got to walk it back. One, as you've said, door number one and door number <laughs> two is he doesn't care about financial conditions yeah. the way you see them as much as you'd like him to or thought he did. Right. And that's basically it. From New York, this is Bloomberg. I will try to keep this brief, but I cannot promise there will not be some tears. This is the best job I've ever had. <laughs> and as I did in 1988 and 2008 and 2020, I look forward to being on your side when you run for president in 2024. Lisa, you can't laugh at that. 
I wasn't the only one laughing. You can't laugh at that. What? Well, I thought he was laughing. I didn't think he was crying. I actually thought he was laughing for a second. But That's the reason why you were laughing. And then when you realized that he was crying, you just started to cry with him. He was emotional. Stop it. He was so confident that on both sides of the aisle, they respect him. Ron Klain, what, they, they hate him, they disagree with him, et cetera, et cetera, but they adore him just because of his policy, competency, and his gentlemanness. Ron Klain, the outgoing White House yeah. chief of staff, and let's not bury the lead here, 2024. Shall I read that quote again? As I did in 1988, 2008, and 2020, I look forward to being on your side when you, ran for, when you run for president in 2024. When? When, not if. <clears throat> when? Come on, can you really read that much into it, or is this just sort of like a collegial? Second time he's done it. Or is this it's like, like a? Time but this is it. like a collegial. Like I'm going to support you to the end, no matter what. You are going to be the leader, kind of. You know. John, I, John like, loves like our. Gonna... Uh, John loves our never-ending campaigns. Goes over in Britain. It's like eight days. <laughs> I know. You know. And then another eight days right after. Yeah, we're going to switch gears here with Amory Horton, and we're going to take a spin off of an important article in the Washington Post today, which talks about. The European dream for Ukraine. It's a really, really important idea about how the continent deals with year two of Ukraine. Amory Horton uh, joins us right now, our Washington correspondent. Amory, I'm going to cut to the chase. I guess there's an American dream out there for Ukraine, for Eastern Europe, et cetera. What is the American dream? I mean, you've been so good on living this in London and here. What is our American dream for Ukraine? Well, I think the first step really is what the U.S. wants to see is Russia leave the territories they are occupying and illegally annexed from Ukraine. So that would be Luhansk, Donetsk. Donetsk overnight there was um, some serious shelling and missile attacks. And Crimea is this interesting place because um, many Russian people really do see Crimea as, as Russian. Um, but there has been more talk, and there was a New York Times article about a month or two ago that the U.S. is considering and warming up to the idea of Ukrainians uh, attacking Crimea and taking Crimea back. A hundred percent, that is the U.S. dream, Crimea included. But I think the first step really is to mm -hmm. make sure they can push Russia back in the worst fighting uh, areas, which is really the eastern parts of Luhansk and Donetsk. Is our, is our American dream, does it mean thousands of American soldiers across the eastern front of Russia from Finland through the Baltic states and to Germany particularly and then down to the Black Sea? Well, this president definitely does not want to send U.S. troops into Ukraine. He's made that pretty clear. Neither do any of the other uh, supporting allies. But obviously, you have seen over the course of the past year, and we're going to be approaching the one-year mark of Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the end of this month, that they have been bolstering the eastern flank with U.S. Uh, military personnel and, and armor as well. I mean, the fog of war with Russia and Ukraine, how much focus is there down in Washington, D.C., on what's going on with Iran and Israel, which seems to be also be uh, escalating? Yeah, this is a, a huge focus for individuals who are following foreign policy, uh, especially since you had Secretary Blinken just in Israel. He also was in the Palestinian territories in Ramallah, uh, meeting with Mr. Aboud as well. This is on the heels of even this morning, you had Israeli warplanes in Gaza and the Israeli army saying they were going after um, ammunition plants as well as military depots for Hamas, where they make weapons. But we are off the heels of one month of probably one of the deadliest months we've seen between Palestinians and Israelis in years. And Secretary Blinken left officials behind to try to make sure they can restore peace and calm. And this is going to be a major topic today in Washington because the president will be having lunch uh, and a big discussion with King Abdullah of Jordan. He was here all week. He was up at the Hill thanking lawmakers for the aid they've been sending to Jordan. But obviously for him, paramount is stability in the Middle East. There's this issue of humanitarian uh, questions around just uh, how, what this could lead to in terms of devastation. There's also a question around crude, it's particularly with Iran, and there was questions about opening it up to the international market. Now that's uh, a little bit further off the table. Given the recent conflict, what are people saying about the potential widening of that conflict and the disruption to crude output, especially on top of what's happening with Russia and Ukraine? 
Well, concerns about any instability in the region has to do in the crude market with the Strait of Hormuz, which 20 million barrels of oil go through a day. When it comes to what Iran is doing right now in terms of oil exports, is we do see an uptick. Um, a lot of this happens in the black market, sometimes ship to ship, and these tankers will shut down their tracking. The U.S. administration has made pretty clear that they're going to go after this. So even though they want to see as much oil on the market, they want to make sure that they are crushing Iran when it comes to they do not want any sort of uh, leeway or uh, any avenue where Iran could be exporting when they should not be. And obviously, most of this crude is ending up in China. AMH, let's finish up by wrapping up this one. When the outgoing White House chief of staff says... I look forward to being by your side when you run for president in 2024. How much weight should we put on that? I think a lot. He said when, not if. <laughs> he was just, it's true, when. He said when you run, not if you run. The president hasn't come out and announced it, but Ron Klain has now announced it maybe two or three times for him. <laughs> hey, Mage, thank you down in TC. It is literally two or three times that he's teed up this run. And the president still hasn't officially announced it. Still early days, TK. Uh, I, don't I don't think there's massive pressure to make that call just yet. But what if he doesn't? Then it gets really interesting, doesn't it? I stand corrected. You know, it, if, if Anne-Marie and you both put weight on this. You didn't need me to say. No, you needed Anne-Marie no, to say. No, I, mean, I, I think both of you are correct. It sort of, you know, is he basically saying, come on, get on it. We talked about this. You're known for taking your time with decisions. Let's go. Out with it. The more momentum you can is build. Is there a rush, though? Do you think there's a rush to make this announcement? There's not a rush when it comes to the actual race. Perhaps there is a bit of a rush when it comes to his political clout within the party right. in terms of his leadership role in order not to be a lame duck president. And that perhaps is how people are going to view his announcement of a run more than anything else. Oh, certainly. If he's not going to run, he needs to give people time to think about whether they should be, yeah. should be running. But he needs to indicate that he's going to run even if he doesn't plan on it. TK? My head's spinning on it. Yeah. I, I, I just wish we were British. I just wish. We'll do it in a week. You know, get, get, we get to May of 2024. You tried. With the pie. We would try. I fast. don't think it's going to work. I don't <laughs> think it's going to work. Can I, can I bring up a bond issue? We mentioned short Please covering do, yeah. yesterday. I thought Zero had used Bloomberg uh, nicely yesterday on uh, Lisa Aggregate Treasury Futures net spec positioning. We talk about equity shorts in gloom covered yesterday, but the bond market short position is stunning. Stunning. He heading, heading into Way this. Way beyond equities. Well, heading into this, there were reports that hedge fund short bets on treasuries had reached record highs heading into this. Now, it's unclear what they were hedging against, right? It's not necessarily a naked short in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. However, that really does indicate, John, just what we're looking at in terms of the violent move, and perhaps it's overstating the interpretation of Jay Powell's remarks. There is one hell of a pain trade emerging <laughs> exactly. in 2022. Better said, yeah. This is so so painful for so many people and because they came into 23 and we all know the consensus because so many people sat in that chair came on this program and said it the first half's going to be dreadful the second half is yeah. going to be all about the recovery and january's just kicked off and we've ripped through last month and it's continued um everybody expected i say everybody nine out of ten people we spoke to yeah all expected chairman powell to face off with easy financial conditions and pushback and he wouldn't even characterize them as easy that was what was ridiculous about it. And do you know where the clue was? The clue was right before the decision. The former vice chair, Richard Clarida, yeah. we asked him how he'd approach it. He just kind of shrugged and said, I think it's a little bit more nuanced. But Tom, to your point, how much is what we're seeing in terms of price action just a direct uh, relation to the pain trade and not necessarily I'm a true strong, statement? I, that's where I am. And, and bonds, too. I'd emphasize the equity-centric nature here is just too much. Way well. Lee coming up from BlackRock. Looking forward to that conversation from New York. This is Bloomberg. As of the close yesterday, the scores year today up 13% on the NASDAQ, on the S&P 500 year today, as of yesterday, up 7.3%. Just what a rally. And we add to it. We had some weight to it this morning. The Nasdaq 100 helped out by Meta up by 1.2%. On the S&P 500 up a third of 1%.
Lisa's going to run you through the meta earnings in just a moment. Let's run through the bond market together. Twos, tens and thirties look like this. The two-year yield to lower by a couple of basis points. The break of 4.1% to the downside. Again on a two-year. Did that yesterday too, briefly. On a ten-year, we're down a couple of basis points again. 3.39. Payroll's coming up tomorrow. Jobless claims a little bit later this morning. The ECB on deck in about 45 minutes. Looking for a 50 basis point hike from the ECB after the BOE goes 50 basis points. Euro dollar looks like this. Very close to 110. 109.98 on euro dollar, positive a tenth of 1%. For those of you football fans, real football, you know where I'm going with this. You'll understand this joke. This from Luke Cower of UBS, the Bank of England. Chelsea's January transfer window, indicative of desperation, not underlying demand for Labour. Uh, if you've been familiar with Chelsea's transfer spending, Tom, they've mm -hmm. spent a fortune over the last month or How so. How did Newcastle come on so well? I mean, I know they beat Southampton. It's not like beating Arsenal, but is that... Outside money, clearly quickly there's, boosting clearly there's some Saudi money, Newcastle. but I will say their strategy in the transfer market has been very different to say when Chelsea first got hold of money mm -hmm. and when Manchester City first got hold of money. Right. They're not throwing hundreds of millions here, there and everywhere. Todd Bowley at Chelsea, right. you know him from the LA Dodgers, he's spending serious money. Enzo Fernandez from Argentina, 107 million sterling. Just I mean, like that. I, I mean, this is important. Lisa's working on earnings and Whaley is going, why am I here? But Conti's sick with Tottenham. Is that a I big saw deal that, yeah. for the future? Well, it's clearly a big you know, deal serious for him. illness. Well, let's hope him the best. When's the operation? Don't know. Don't, okay. I didn't speak to me. I, I never thought you and I would be talking about this, but we are. No, but this there we good. are. But I mean, I'm like, how do they move forward and compete with Newcastle and the rest of it? Well, they're going to have to spend a lot of money. Well, at least got one foot out the door. Let's get going. <laughs> Just stay there, Wade. <laughs> Wade, stay there. Stay there. We've got a ton of earnings coming up later. At least uh, we started with to yesterday yeah. then it's the big three a little bit later this afternoon yeah alphabet amazon and apple all of them are coming mm -hmm. out and intraday we are seeing uh, the shares gaining on the heels of what we saw yesterday from meta i am interested in the underperformance of apple which is interesting to me because they haven't performed as well to date as the others and this possibly is because there was already a lot of froth built in or i don't want to say froth but there's already a lot of strength built in there those shares up one percent amazon shares up more than four percent alphabet four point six percent we talk about Meta. I just want to give some perspective here. Yeah, the shares are climbing, surging in pre-market trading. But since November 3rd, the shares are up more than 70 percent before even the gains that we're seeing intraday. They could have doubled since their low on November 3rd. Easy come, easy go. What are we even pricing anymore, John, when you take a look at some of these moves? How do you gain what's being priced in and whether it's just all a tied to sentiment? I think at the end of the day, the fears, the fears a number of months ago around the direction of this company because you have to remember the control of one man at Meta. It is one man with a ton of control to spend a ton of money. And there was a fear that he was just going to run away with this. OK, but there, the existential risk of mm. will Instagram be the social platform du jour in two years is still there, right? I mean, it's not like they're materially changing their potential prospects. In fact, they're even more hinged to the two platforms did, that they have. So again, I don't know what we're pricing in here. Did he identify what the metaverse is? You're really yesterday. keyed into this. I think that, you know. Throwing I mean, money like, at it and trying to figure it out. I'm like, $40 billion buyback, I can handle that. I, 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 I'm absolutely baffled by this. To me, it's almost childish. I just don't get it. I mean, I feel foreign. You want my view on this? Please, I'm asking. I think social media has caused so much harm in society. And to then sit here and say that we need to live virtually, and that's the future, I, I find that deeply, deeply upsetting. Not to get too serious about it, but I do. This company's been criticized for so many different things. Hurting the psychology okay. of, of young people. I, all right, I just briefly, before we you get to You want to push Lee. back against that? Good yeah, luck Yeah, I'm going to push back against sure, that. Totally agree with that. Okay, However, the in the spirit of you know science fiction, in the spirit of exploration of all of the new technologies, there should be a platform to explore the potential for things. The problem is the dominance and the complete, uh, you know, subsuming of all competitors and also the influence that some of these platforms have. So two different issues because you want to also encourage some of the innovation there, too. That's my two cents. OK, cool. I, we just <laughs> never have three people bought a show to stop show to a stop like we just did. Uh, there's a group effort, I might point out. Right now, an important conversation you with Wei Lee. Zuckerberg's world. Have fun. Yeah. I'll take a pass. Wei Lee with us now, global chief investment strategist at BlackRock, and she knows Lawrence Fick is Fink is gonna walk back to Chairman's comments yesterday. What were you thinking at 2.45 p.m. yesterday? Glued to your Bloomberg and seeing what we saw. 
It was quite an incredible day. Yeah. Going into the meeting itself, we thought the focus would be around the disconnect between market pricing in terms of cash paths, future rate cuts, and what the Fed is going to say. But we, what we ended up having is a <coughs> disconnect between Jay Powell and himself. Right In his prepared <laughs> remarks, he was very clear that they will stay the course until the job is done. Mm -hmm. He was also very clear that parts of the market service inflation, core service inflation, they have yet to to see signs of disinflation. But in the unscripted part, uh, the press uh, conference, he then was not uh, uh, clear in pushing back against the financial conditions. And he was also distancing a little bit from the December forecast, right. uh, but without giving uh, any clue in terms of what he thinks it could be. And that's why markets then just jump. Uh, you, jump. you have an institutional call of a shorter duration, I'm mm -hmm. going to call it somewhat higher yield strategy. Mm -hmm. We're all conversant in equities and shorting. There seems to be a massive short bet in the in the in the bond market as well. Mm -hmm. Do you worry about a jump condition where you get a bond short cover and you get price up as a general statement and yield shockingly lower? Is that part of your probabilistic structure? I think what we have seen so far this year mm -hmm. is uh, a everything rally, right? So John talked about equity rally, but it has been an incredible rally in bond market as well. And part of that was driven precisely, as you said, Tom, this short covering, short squeeze, and also this fear of missing out. So think about everybody finishing 2020 deeply traumatic year across equities and bonds. And start of 2023, sentiment seems to be taking a turn and people just to just wants to jump in without kind of assessing how much of the damage is being priced in, which at this juncture, none of the damage is being priced in. People are talking about, is it going to be recession? Is it going to be soft landing? Markets are pricing in take off from here. We're not talking about landing anything. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a huge amount of animal spirit boosted by cash being deployed uh, into the market. And this is the momentum that we're seeing. If Jay Powell doesn't push back against this market, as he did not yesterday, what's going to trigger some sort of reversal in what we're seeing right now? I think when it becomes clear that uh, parts of the inflation uh, complex is still persistent, is still sticky. So specifically, we're talking about core service acts shelter, right? Like, yes, uh, goods uh, service rotation leading to goods uh, disinflation. That is a trend that has been many months in the making. Uh, shelter, expecting that to come down over time as well. But service, uh, uh, core service acts shelter, very linked to wage uh, dynamics as well. Labor market is still very, very tight. And I think the jury is still out there that we can be comf uh, comfortable and complacent that inflation is on the way down, all the way to targets. What's your conviction level? I mean, is this the time to lean heavily against the tech rally, to basically sell everything, cash out, and just hide out in cash until uh, you start to see that downfall? I think this is the time to stay invested. Right now, we don't want to chase the tech rally just because of the incredible momentum that you yourself described as well. And uh, more broadly, looking at what uh, developed market equities are pricing, very, very positive outcome is priced for perfection. It's hard for us to chase that. But we have had a preference for emerging markets that have been doing really well on a year to day basis. We have had a preference for short duration bonds and IG credit and mortgage uh, agency. Uh, backed mortgages and all of that have been holding up okay as well. We're talking about an everything rally. So staying invested is important. Well, just to finish on the Federal Reserve, if we can, we talked a long time about the end of the Fed put, the introduction of a Fed call. Did that get done away with yesterday in that news conference? Well, he was not very consistent within himself. So I think markets uh, are reading into it what it wants to read into it, which is to jump and, and, and kind of build momentum and, and chase this rally. So I think it's too early to say, do we have a Fed put turning into a Fed call, turning back into a Fed put? We don't have a very consistent Fed at this moment. We'll hear from Chairman Powell next week. And Tom, the question still being asked, is there a cleanup act that needs to be done? <laughs> I, I, yes, and I, I, I think you're, it's, I have to admit, as I said, I may actually read the minutes, and all of a sudden, well, these good speeches, news. <laughs> particularly, from, particularly from the vice chairman, from Brainerd, I, I, yeah. th I'm sorry, There's, and, and Whaley nailed it in, in, in her first response, this idea of there were two Powells there yesterday. 
That's accurate. When you're that hesitant about asking a very direct question about whether you discussed the pause or not, largely implies they probably discussed the pause. Of course they did. Why the hesitancy? Because he didn't want the outcome that he got anyway, right? I mean, this is the issue, is that this is the reason why perhaps he's going to push back. Because if he did have conviction in being able to be fully transparent, didn't want to send a different message, why not just say, yeah, we talked about it, we talked about everything? We can find that in the minutes anyway. <laughs> exactly. He was like, read the minutes, go away. one Fed official that, that brings it up in the next <clears throat> couple of weeks. We talked about this. The closer you get to, to say, 5%, and we are getting closer, if you just look at the range of the dots in the dot plot from the summary of economic projections at the last meeting, not this one, the one before, it pretty much tells you we're getting to that point where a couple right. of individuals are going to say enough's enough. And other individuals, I, I think Neil Kashgari's out there and he's a voter this year, Tom, who said, I want to go to 540. So that dissent's coming one way or the other unless I, the data changes convincingly the in data, one direction. And he, to his credit, Powell circled back routinely to an ex post strategy by a central bank, which is not an original thought. That's the way it works. John, can you translate for me? Sure, what you need. May of 1940, Churchill. Okay. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory. The British love the word victory. Victory. And the governor's channeling it Too this soon. morning. Churchill had a most serious time for Wait, the nation. But Is this your but, effort to be British? No, I, 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 I can't be British. Soon. You know, yeah. Pharaoh's put, it's, he says, once Pharaoh just said, he was give up. growling earlier. Yeah, but, sure but, 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 Churchill. But, uh, You're growling. Ba Lisa wants Bailey, to be in the metaverse. I don't know what's going on this morning. John, <laughs> Bailey says too early to declare victory over inflation. Oh, what it is. I think Chairman Powell basically said the same thing. You're definitely going to hear the same thing from President Lagarde in an hour from now. I'm, I have to admit, I'm actually, it's not going to be a snooze fest. <laughs> well, let's not go there. Wait, can I just say thank you? Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you for tolerating yes, us. Yes, we're going to, from now on, after every Fed meeting, Whaley. <laughs> She's no like, question. absolutely not. I, I love that. I love that. Bring, Hold this meeting bring Larry Fink next time. Coming up. <laughs> I would take notes. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Markets rallied after the Fed raised interest rates by a quarter point. That despite Fed Chair Jerome Powell warning that further rate hikes lie ahead. Still, he acknowledged that the U.S. economy is in an era of disinflation, of price pressures cooling. North Korea has shut the door on talks with the U.S. over its nuclear arsenal. Kim Jong-un's foreign ministry also pledged to respond to what it sees as threats from the U.S. After firing off a record number of ballistic missiles last year, North Korea has been relatively quiet to start 2023. It's only tested one missile so far. Aides to President Biden and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi are discussing a possible state visit to Washington this year. So far, the president has only hosted Francis Emmanuel Macron for a state visit. The U.S. and India are working to share advanced defense and computing technology. Israeli warplanes bombed parts of the Gaza Strip early today. Officials described the targets as a chemical plant and a weapons manufacturing site for Hamas, which Israel describes as a terrorist organization. That comes after a month of bloody clashes between Israelis and Palestinians. And shares of Carvana are on the rise as the used car dealer is on course for its sixth session of straight gains. It comes amid a rally in riskier assets following sign from the Fed that inflation is easing. Shares are set to hit their highest level in over three months. They're up 186 percent this year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. They're feeling their way along. They're in a new phase in many respects. Now they believe they are going truly meeting by meeting, and they probably need more, a little bit more restrictive stance of policy. Uh, and in March, we'll learn a lot. We'll learn a lot about how they actually see this play ending. We've got to wait until March. That was Dennis Lockhart, the former Fed Atlanta president. Equity futures right now, Tom, are positive about four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Let's work through the price action. 
in your bond market. Yields lower by four or five basis points. On a 10-year, 337.26. Euro dollar totally unchanged. 109.85. But had a look at 110 going into the ECB. The ECB about 30 minutes away. We're looking for 50 basis points. And if you remember how December went, we had one of those news conferences with Chairman Powell where we were like, is that it? Let's move on. And then President Lagarde came out and sent everything lower. So <laughs> look out ECB a little bit later. HSBC making that point a little bit earlier this morning. I'll bring up their quote from their team. With the February Fed event risk now gone, it might be tempting to go all in on equities and other risk assets. But beware, the potentially bigger hawk, the ECB, Tom, is lurking just around the corner. It is, and I, you know, and I, I want to say within the central bank overlay, and I'm really, as I, I'm not kidding, folks. I'm actually really enthused by how Christine Lagarde handles this moment she has this morning. But John, I, I, I'm looking at Nasdaq 100 up 1.4 percent. I'm looking at the chart, literally the chart that got me hired at Bloomberg. We're not allowed to show it on TV; it's too much information, and you know, it's on a classified need-to-know basis. But John, I'm looking at the Nasdaq 100, which is called log, log convex on a three-day chart. There is an acceleration to this, which is tangible. You can see it on the screen. I will say there's a meta factor in there too, Tom, the fact that it is up 19% in the pre-market. <clears throat> Happened at the NASDAQ just a little bit. What it's about this afternoon? afternoon? It's a big afternoon, Lisa, for earnings later. I would agree, and I wonder how much you get that ongoing loosening of financial conditions. The frustration that I feel in the notes parsing the speak yesterday <laughs> is really telling. So this is Andrew Hollenhorst coming out basically saying Chair Powell followed the recent run of optimistic Fed speak and failed to significantly push back on looser financial conditions, which led to further loosening. Okay. And then basically said we're pushing back against this narrative that we're going to get this perfect landing, everything's going to be great because we're going to get a hot I, jobs report and everything's going to be back on track in terms of inflation I, still running very high. I mean, we're among friends here. I mean, good morning, everyone on radio and TV. I had a beverage of my choice in my hands after our 18-hour day yesterday. Okay. And what am I thinking about? Can you okay. imagine the conversation of Mike Wilson and Ellen Zentner at Morgan Stanley? Zentner publishes today, you know, four and three quarters, wherever she is, below the Holland Horse line, below, below Anna Wong. Mike Wilson's got to re-justify a cautious stance, I guess is how I would put it. That must have been a hell of a conversation. Look, I caught up with him yesterday. One, don't fight the Fed was the message. Yes, yeah. it was in the notes. Why 101. The it's there, his words. But ultimately, too, his call is bad earnings, and the earnings haven't been great. The question I've asked, and I've spoken to Mike about this, I asked him yesterday, Mike, you can learn something from the incoming information. You can also learn something about the way the market responds to that incoming information, and this market is rallying. And he took note of that, but ultimately he thinks over the next couple of quarters, you're going to get a drip feed of this, just bad earnings, bad earnings, and we're going to bump into some weak data. And Mislav Mateka over at JP Morgan alongside Marko Kalanovic basically saying the same thing. You're going to hit an air pocket of weak data in the next couple of quarters. It's coming, which is why the bears, as they stand, this is incredibly painful. And if you're in this market and you're trying to short it, yeah. that's incredibly expensive. This hurts. Well, this hurts, but the call still stands for them. The weak data's coming. But putting together what you both have talked about, a short squeeze and the fully painful, the maximum pain of January, you put that together, is this the great flush in the opposite direction before people start to really mm -hmm. understand the earnings and what we're seeing uh, that perhaps challenges some of the I'm data dependent, and I'm going to go with Julian Emanuel and Ed Hyman where they're modeling out 3% inflation. Maybe it's 3.5. I'll let Mr. Hyman tell me uh, what the response is there. But the answer is there's a disinflation tone in check. Maybe not in oil, where China and the Pacific Rim may come out of a very difficult COVID environment, and there's some modeling of higher oil prices yet to occur. 82.19 on Brent crude. We speak to head of all of our hydrocarbon efforts and commodities. Will Kennedy joins us now from uh, London. Will, there's a feverish tone in the United States states about profits of oil companies and windfall profits and the rest of it. If they're minting money now at $80 a barrel, how much are they going to mint at $110 a barrel? Well, they are. that's going to be good for their profits, obviously, Tom, but I would point out that a lot of this year's profits have been based on natural gas prices, especially Shell that we saw today, where they clearly made an enormous amount of money from selling their LNG portfolio into Europe. Um, and gas prices are markedly lower, especially in the United States, where they've fallen right back to two. So, yes, a bullish outlook for oil will be good for uh, energy companies, and we expect them to keep making a right. lot of money. But I would just urge people to think about the gas side of the equation as well. You have a terrific perspective of our reporters in North America and our reporters in Europe. 
On the debate of profitability, what is the major divide or distinction of the governments of Europe, regulation of Europe, if you will, and of the United States? Well, clearly in Europe we've had windfall taxes and in the US there's been some discussion of windfall taxes but they're unlikely, I believe, for political reasons to ever get off the ground. So that's a, a big difference and I think there's a big difference in strategy which is partly political between Europe and the US and this is really interesting right now. Uh, in the US there's been little investment by the big companies Chevron and Exxon in new energy. They've concentrated on making it money and giving it back to shareholders. In the case of Chevron this enormous 75 billion dollar share value back. In the Europe they tried to walk a path of doing some of that and some investing in new energy and it hasn't proved as popular. I think the American model is winning here. If we look at the returns, uh, returns for investors on Chevron and Exxon far outstrip returns for Shell um, and the noises from the new Shell leadership, they got a new CEO, is that they're going to focus on those returns which means giving more money back to shareholders and less focus on the energy transition which obviously has more political purchase in uh, Europe than some parts of the United States. So in that regard I think the US energy companies are winning the political argument. Why are prices still falling on crude? Well I think that we should probably be looking there at the amount of oil that is coming from Russia. Uh, Russia continues to do a very good job of exporting a huge amount of its crude oil. They're finding customers in India and China, albeit at discounted prices. But if we look at overall Russian crude production, it's still close to 11 million barrels a day, uh, pretty much what it was before the war. And I think continue, people continue to be supplied on the upside by Russian production, Russian exports. And as long as that continues at that pace, the market may remain a little bit soft. Will that offset, will any kind of reopening from China and perhaps dampen uh, that inflationary impulse? I mean, it seems to be for the time being. How long that lasts, I don't know. We get into the summer and demand for crude tends to rise in what we call the driving season in the U.S. Uh, and refining margins suggest that there is demand for fuel around the world. Um, and eventually that will start to draw in more crude. So perhaps, but it, not clear yet, I would say. I will. Thank you. As always, Will Kennedy there of Bloomberg on the energy situation. We are about 20 minutes away from the ECB decision. Christine Lagarde will deliver that at about 8.15 <coughs> Eastern time. 30 minutes after that, you get a news conference with the ECB president, Tom. Are we looking for another hawkish turn from the ECB chief oh, after what she delivered back in December? She's not going to declare victory. I know that for certain, as Governor Bailey was alluding to as well. John, you've got real first order experience with this as well. Explain the body language right now that is someone mentioned, the lawyer from Paris. Uh, explain the body language that she has to straddle between, say, the core of Europe, the Netherlands, the Bundesbank, and others that are, are saying, be a little kind. We have a really different backdrop. So if you think about the battle that, let's say, President Draghi had to have with the core of Europe, with the Bundesbank, it was because inflation was just way too low. Inflation's too high. It's a single mandate central bank. Tom, it's pretty clear what they've got to do. They've got to get interest rates up, financial conditions tight, and inflation lower at a time where I think finally, for the first time in a long time, they're actually concerned about a tight labour market in a way, just relatively speaking, they haven't been before. So, Tom, if that's the case, guess what? You're not fighting. You're not fighting a core of Europe. In fact, after that news conference in December, I had the feeling many other people did too. That was like the Bundesbank meeting over in Frankfurt, Germany, at ECB headquarters. They are in the driving seat, Tom, big time. Yeah, well, and again, that's the divide there in the politics. And let's remind everyone, they do not have a fiscal policy to play off of. I mean, Blanchard's new book is entirely fiscal, linking it into monetary. I don't think you can do that in Europe. So we touched on the China issue yesterday around the Federal Reserve, far more pertinent for the ECB. I hope that comes up in the news conference. How are they thinking about China reopening, what it means for growth and what it means for inflation? And we are hearing about that a bit from Bailey as well, talking about external pressures easing, even as domestic pressures firm up. Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon coming up. Looking forward to that conversation. Your ECB rate decision about 15 minutes away.
continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. This is a Fed that really has been pushing back, particularly on the easing of financial market conditions. What the markets heard was this issue of the conflict between financial conditions easing and whether or not that would impact the Fed's policy making. If price inflation continues to come down as it has, it does open up a greater path to a soft landing. People forget that you can have a recession and while it's going on, you don't know you're in it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. It's a 24, 30-hour marathon of huge information flow. In this hour and 15 minutes, John Farrow on the ECB with his decades of experience on the lawn in Frankfurt and the three-hour lunch afterwards. <laughs> Is that how That's what it's like, right? <laughs> yeah. 30 years at the ECB covering yeah. Frankfurt, Germany. Tom, yeah, it's important. 50 basis points. They're set to go again. We had that guidance from President Lagarde back in December that this will keep going. We had a bit of pushback in a couple of stories, Tom, and maybe some of Fed officials, some ECB officials rather, unhappy with the trajectory of things. But ultimately, CPI is still too high. Inflation is too elevated. The ECB has more work to do. What's interesting about today, and this is just a small point, a footnote maybe, we didn't get German CPI this week. It got delayed by a week, and we had this downside surprise on Eurozone inflation. So maybe we'll get some comments I, on that. And I brought a thing, and I want to go to a wonderful Goldman Sachs angle and then stay with us, Global Wall Street. This will be fun. But, John, we're going full circle here back to another time. I mean, the governor of the Bank of England is declaring, is saying we can't declare victory. We're going back to a time when money costs something. Discipline's there was back. inflation. Discipline is back. Well, you know, the gravity's back, as Taleb says. Why have you got Mark Zuckerberg going out there right exactly. now? Exactly. Saying it's exactly. the year of efficiency. It's the year of efficiency because it's the year of 4% interest rates. And Lisa, <clears throat> maybe five. Well, yeah, this is exactly it. So you're going to see this sort of rationalization and layoffs in, in certain companies that have been built up over the longer period. However, the cumulative, long and cumulative lags. Remember that? We're not talking about that anymore. Right. It's just basically we're done. And perhaps people are saying, OK, it's not a victory lap. We're not done. That's what Jay Powell was saying. But that's not what he was doing. He was kind of indicating, you know, we're kind of getting into this good disinflationary place. We've got huge news flow this morning, really, right through the morning. ECB, the Lagarde press conference will be important. Even I'm saying uh, that. And then we go on to the earnings soiree. And, John, as I mentioned, we come full circle. Can we go back to 1981? Would you like to do that now? I was <laughs> knee deep studying the commodity world of Will Kennedy, who we just had on. And Goldman Sachs went out because Salomon Brothers was big in commodities. And they bought Jay Aaron and they bought into it from Jay Aaron a guy named Blankfein. And commodities now are coming full circle. Bloomberg reports this morning, Sri Natarajan and his team, that they made three billion large revenue in commodities this year. And I'm sorry, like the rate market, like China reopening, I feel very full circle this morning. That unit recorded the biggest revenue gain since at least 2009, according to Sri and Jack Farchi's report. They should reporting. bring Blank Fight back. I mean, I just, <laughs> hey, don't I mean, start rumors. <laughs> don't start rumors. But Tom, let's tie some stories together. The yeah. energy story was massive in the last 12 months. I don't think it's over. It's not over. Let's be clear about that. It really isn't. Look at the and, war in, in Ukraine, Tom. Look at the war yes. in Ukraine. The uncertainty isn't over. Let me be more specific. The uncertainty around that war is not over and what it means for Europe. And if there's a central bank right now, Tom, that still faces some difficulty, it is arguably the ECB. You've yeah. got this war in Ukraine on the one side, China reopening on the other. I've got no idea what the data is going to look like, Lisa, in the next 12 months. Traders often do well in volatile times. Are we entering a new, more volatile time with the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of England not clamping down on volatility to the same degree? Could How do you be. rearrange Could that? Be. And that, to me, is really the highlight from what we saw yesterday from the Fed uh, press conference. We are entering an era where they're not trying to control the market in the same way that they used to. And this is one of price discovery or, and is one of prices really Exactly. Swinging. If it is price discovery and we clear the markets, as Torsten Slock of Apollo writes this morning, do we get clarity? Maybe we got that yesterday from Paul. I'll let John decide. We get clarity. I'll get to decide. <laughs> and then do we get a new lesser volatility once we clear ourselves out of these pandemic volatile times? I don't think he wanted to commit to anything yesterday. He certainly didn't even want to commit to the dot plot or the projections of the December meeting. We've got some data to come over the next couple of months. And when we reconvene on the FOMC in March, Tom, 
towards the back end of March. We'll oh. get some new forecasts. If there is a bias <clears throat> that exists right now, though, I think there is a belief that when we get those forecasts, that dot right. plot might come in a little bit, GDP might get pushed higher a little bit, and things start to go in that direction. I keep going back to what Don Constant said to us yesterday over at Mizuho. Just by definition, if it's a hard landing, at first it will look like a soft one. This takes time to play out. The one last bastion of the economic data is the labour market. It's always the labour market. It's a lagging indicator. Yes. Claims you can make the argument it's a coincidental indicator, a coincidental I get all that. That's fine. And it's super, super low. But look at the ISM. That doesn't look like things are very good right now. It's starting to <clears> spread <throat> to services. And we'll see how this trend develops in the next couple of months. So if you're the chairman, I think from that standpoint, did the right thing. Hard to commit to anything right now, given where we're at. A quick data check to get to our wonderful guest, Jeffrey Yu. John, I'm looking at the real yield, the 10-year real yield. Do we begin to think about a sub-1% 10-year real yield? 1.12%, a lower inflation-adjusted yield. A nominal yield, 339 on a 10-year, down a couple of basis points. Euro dollar <coughs> unchanged going into the ECB, Tom, 109.89. And equity futures, just a lift once again, up a half of 1% on the S&P. He can synthesize the moment. Jeffrey Yu joins us now, senior market strategist at BNY. Mellon. Jeffrey, give us the sum of all these Fed, BOE, and ECB parts. What's the distillate that you will write about come Friday or into Monday? Well, I still think it's about the real rates of situation, uh, Tom. Uh, you were mentioning the, the, the cost of money um, in terms of corporates, uh, but that's a nominal cost right now. We need to look at the real cost. If you deflate everything, if you deflate rates right now by wage gains, uh, by the problems in the labor market, still argue, you know, conditions are relatively loose, right? You can make a case for actually increasing CapEx, increasing credit, especially anticipating the Chinese demand coming through. So I think all in all, central banks will have a case that maybe things are looking to turn the corner. The financial conditions are not where they want them to be. The markets should take notice. You know, no one's pivoting anytime soon. Jeff, let's pick up on that. The chairman didn't exactly say financial conditions aren't where they want them to be. What did you make of that? Well, again, it's really where do you think on a forward looking basis you know, can, can financial conditions you know, glide us to a place where growth is going to start to soften in a way that pressures inflation, right? It's a dynamic process. You only find out where you got you want to be after you get there, right? So I know a lot of it, you can't prove the counterfactual, but at this point, do they have enough confidence that conditions are restrictive enough, not just in the US, but globally, with the glut of excess liquidity? You know, you calculate excess liquidity against GDP ratios, still at record highs. Even in the US, you know, where the decline has been quite strong, we're only down by a few percentage points of nominal GDP. ECB, for all the hawkish talk, they haven't even started yet, right? So by that measure alone, there's potential for loose, uh, for loose financial conditions, and that's what they need to be wary of. But at least the path is in the right place. Well, Jeff, let's talk about the path and the long and variable lags that no one seems to be talking about, or at least focusing on right now. When will we see the brunt of the actions that all of the central banks globally have taken? Right. Then the proof is, I would say, in when they expect that base effect um, to come in, as Governor Bailey you know, highlighted about half an hour ago, uh, there's going to be an accelerated decline in inflation the second half of the year uh, when uh, those uh, base effects that we saw last year start to roll off. And if those figures, when they start to come in, uh, surprise them to the downside, I think it will be after the fact that they'll realize maybe they have done enough or maybe they've done too much and then they can pivot as quickly as possible. But until then, they need to retain the optionality. Going back to what Governor Bailey said, risks have never been so skewed to the upside in terms of inflation. So when you have those kind of upside risk skew, then you cannot afford to say, you know, we can pivot now. We are in a place where we want to be. So I think it's retaining that optionality. And the moment they can confirm uh, that things are in line with expectations or the target or going back to inflation targets is clear, then they can move immediately. We saw a pretty violent move, a pain trade move up for equities, uh, down for bond yields in the first uh, month of 2023. What aspect of this would you push back against? Uh, well, you know, firstly, you know, one reason why uh, you are seeing this pain trade you know, towards risk, and there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. If you look at our own iFlow custody data, you know, for example, in you know, last year was a record outflow year for emerging markets. And so now people are going back into emerging markets. We're seeing plenty of buying in Turkey, um, for example, um, and other areas. If you look at the ICI data, half a trillion dollars in worth of outflows in mutual funds. You can go back, but you need to be selective. Where we would push back is you know, anticipating that the sectors that have done well over the last two years, they are going to continue to do well. Now, 
in fairness, you know, we are seeing better performance in our flow data. So in emerging market, especially Asia Pacific, and the selective um, high yield areas um, uh, relating to sovereign debt. So people are being selective, but we need to be cautious about the symmetry. There is not going to be symmetry. What worked in 2020, 2021 risk up is not going to work this time around. Jeff, I want to squeeze one more in. This comes from Hyperconvexity ad on Twitter. It's actually a really good point, and I'd love your thoughts on it because you've touched on some elements of this. You guys are talking about earnings and valuations. The story is in positioning and flows. How would you respond to that? Well, um, that is absolutely right. I'm an FX guy, as you know. I look at euro positioning you know, based on our iFlow data at a 20-year high right now. So let's listen to Madame Lagarde. Um, but it would take a monumental hawkish outcome uh, for us to look at our flow and positioning data to say you want to add to euros at these levels. It's overstretched. The, the comeback you know, from September levels has been a bit too violent. Valuation's not as attractive yet. Uh, so I think right now the euro is going to be on defensive you know, for the rest of the quarter. Hey, Jeff, wonderful. As always, Jeff, you there, FBNY Mellon, Euro dollar earlier on higher the session 110.33 yeah. it's back down Tom to about 109.92 uh, four minutes away from that decision the, the pulse of the screen now it's not like it was yesterday yesterday the short cover was absolutely stunning but even with meta I'm sorry there's a lift I mean SPX is up half a percent NASDAQ 100 with meta up 1.4 but meta's not a Dow stock is it I don't think so. Uh, up 1.4 uh, percent as well. But there's something going. There's there's an undercurrent here going on, linking together equities, bonds, currencies, and dare I say, even commodities. I mean, we don't have the oil lift that maybe we'll get. It's what we didn't get yesterday. We just didn't get that pushback <clears throat> at all. We I didn't get that pushback. Strongly agree with that at yes. all. Steve Englander this week, a Stan Sharp said they're looking for that pause in March. Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley now looking for that pause. In March, I wonder how big that club grows as we get more data going into that decision. Did you talk about the pause? Mm, uh, uh, read the minutes. <laughs> I saw someone clip that at you yesterday and put that out on Twitter. And it got so much love. And it was so true. That was like the 10-second the summary of the like, Fed decision. Uh, Did you miss it? Yeah. Uh, that was it. Literally the entirety that was of it. it. That was it. <laughs> Ibrahim Ratbari coming up, the ECB. He won't pause. Moments away. <laughs> you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. The Bank of England has raised interest rates another one half of one percentage point. The central bank said that there would be further tightening if inflation persists. Policymakers also see a shorter, shallower recession than they did in November. Meanwhile, we'll hear from the European Central Bank in just a few minutes. It was one of the biggest hauls ever for commodity traders at Goldman Sachs. Bloomberg's learned that they brought in more than $3 billion in revenue last year. The unit emerged as a key profit engine at a time when Goldman's net income was cut in half to $10.8 billion. Ukraine fears that a new Russian offensive is underway. According to The New York Times, Russia is assembling hundreds of thousands of troops in Ukraine. It's also stepped up artillery attacks. All this comes at a time when Ukrainian forces are waiting to receive tanks and other weapon systems from the U.S. and European allies. Israeli warplanes bombed parts of the Gaza Strip early today. Officials describe the targets as a chemical plant and a weapons manufacturing site for Hamas, which Israel describes as a terrorist organization. That comes after a month of bloody clashes between Israelis and Palestinians. And the U.S. has won expanded access to more military bases in the Philippines. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin called it a really big deal after visiting military bases and meeting his Philippine counterpart. It will clear the way for a greater American presence in the region as tensions with China persist. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. They're not cutting rates anytime soon, and they're still doing QT. And sometimes it's just passing of these events. People realize, oh, I guess there really wasn't any new information in there that should change my view on stocks, which should be based on the following, that earnings are disappointing everywhere, okay? This is one of the worst streaks in earnings we've seen in quite a while. 
That was Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley, live from New York City, moments away from an ECB decision, about 30 seconds away. Sometimes you get a drip feed, it takes a while, so sit tight. We're looking for a 50 basis point hike from the ECB. Going into yeah. it, equities look like this, positive tom by six tenths of 1%. The euro had a look at 110 earlier on in the session. Since then, Tom, backed yeah. away just a little bit. We'll get the headlines, but Mike Wilson's dead on. We're giving Matt and Tech the love. You know what, John? Honeywell and the rest of them a little soggy, to say the least. Mike said the earnings were terrible. He compared the investor reaction to a tornado going through your house, a surprise tornado, and waking up and saying, oh, good, it's only the best room that got destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is this feeling that some people are saying it's actually better than expected, and yet here we go. Here we go. 50 basis points from the ECB. The main refinancing rate goes from 250 to 3%. The marginal lending facility goes from 275 to 325 And the depot rate goes from... 2% to 250. I have to say, I never thought we'd get here, but here we are. 250, and we break back through 110 on euro dollar. The headlines are going to keep coming out. Lisa, you go through them. I'm going to bring up the statement, and we'll work through this together. Yeah, I'm looking right now at a meeting-to-meeting -meeting approach to further rate decisions. I'm also, uh, I find it interesting that they talk about continuing to uh, roll off the APP portfolio. It's starting to fall from March, so we'll have to dig into what they say about balance sheet uh, types of action. Also saying that rates still have to rise significantly and at a steady pace. This is the hawkish uh, kind of tilt that people were looking for, even as they reiterate some of the other uh, rhetoric in the last meeting. So here's the statement for you. The governing council will stay the course in raising interest rates significantly at a steady pace and in keeping them at levels that are sufficiently restrictive to ensure a timely return to inflation to its 2% medium term target. Accordingly, the governing council today decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points and expects to raise them further. In view of the underlying inflation pressures, the governing council intends to raise interest rates by another 50 basis points at its next monetary policy meeting in March, and it will then evaluate the subsequent path of its monetary policy. So never mind the end of forward guidance. That's basically a commitment <laughs> to go 50 basis points in March. They go on to say keeping interest rates at restrictive levels will over time reduce inflation by dampening demand and will also guard against the risk of a persistent upward shift in inflation expectations. In any event, the Governing Council's future policy rate decisions will continue to be data dependent and follow a meeting by meeting approach. Apparently, just not the March meeting, because that'll be 50, 50. But everything after that is meeting by meeting. I wonder how much guidance they got from Fed Chair Jay Powell. Basically, if you want to be hawkish, you've got to give specifics and you've got to push back. Basically saying, don't even pretend that we're going to step down. We're not stepping down. Let's go. And how much is this basically the guidance that they're giving to really uh, shake the market into acquiescence? Let's work through the price action off the back of it. Looking at German bond yields, lower at the front end by seven basis points, 257 on a 10-year lower by about 10 or 11 basis points. Bear in mind that yesterday we had a big rally in the bond market in Treasuries too. But yields lower in Germany and they stay lower. Looking at the FX market, euro dollar, where are we? We can bring that up quickly for you. Euro dollar pushing through 110 earlier and then backing away at 109.95. So it's over you, President Lagarde, Tom, in about, what, 30 yeah. minutes' time? As you look at the yields come in, it, Italy yields came in as well. I don't want to make too much about it. It's sort of range-bound, but the spread Italy as compared to Germany comes in a little bit uh, as, as well. But it's the same thing as we saw with Powell. It's a lower rate regime, and I would translate that as price up is more important than the yield down. This is a price money moving in, buying into the paper because of a trend that's out there. I don't understand this. Which this bit? is This is unabashedly pretty hawkish, basically saying we're going to raise rates for another 50 basis points, two meetings, 100 basis point increase after people said that they were never going to get off zero or even negative. <sighs> And you have bonds rallying, <laughs> yields lower, and you have pretty muted moves. I'm just trying to wrap my head around what the positioning well, I, was I, heading I, into this, if this is viewed as dovish. Yeah, I'm going to go to the math of adverbs. And it's significantly Thursday is definitely what this is. We got significantly at the Bank of England. We got significantly. And that means the rate of change. I mean, that to me is is central bank talk for some form of rate of change up. We're on a vector. We're going to stay on the vector. And again, the data, and we're going to watch all that. But significantly is not an unimportant word here. No, it? look, they're going to go 50, and then we'll see. 
And I think it's the we'll data. see yeah. that the market's picking up on. Yeah. I don't want to define this statement by what happens in that market because this can all change in this news conference. I always say that. But it's 50, and 50 is what we expected at the next meeting as well. Okay, I understand that. And actually, one uh, viewer writes in, why not just do uh, the extra 50 basis point rate hike right <laughs> well, now? I'm, I'm okay? with them. I'm so with them. Yeah. there is this question. And yet at the same time, is this just a market that wants to feel dovish no matter what the central banks say? I do find it funny when they come out and say it's meeting by meeting, it's data dependent. But that meeting in March, we got 50 basis points. <laughs> yeah. Maria Tadejo joins us now out of Frankfurt. Maria, what do you make of this one? Well, I, my question is a question to you. I've been standing here in the cold, in the rain, and everything has been revealed <laughs> in the statement. 50 basis points, it was super baked in. Everyone knew they were going to hike 50 basis points today. The only question, the thing that made this interesting was would we get Ben Abnagat saying, I'm not going to pivot and go hard in March, and it has been revealed in the statement. So essentially, I spent 10 hours in the cold. Uh, well, for, for <laughs> everything revealed uh, very quickly here. 50 today, 50 in March. And then the other thing, again, they also say after that is data dependent, which, again, is what the market was expecting. After that, right. probably downshift to 25 basis points. Maybe she even says that. But my work here in many ways is done today, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, uh, uh, they're doing, John, what are they doing? they got a headline here at 3 o'clock uh, Frankfurt time. going to find a little bit more key, about the QT asset purchase thing. program and I mean, QT. Sure. I think she's setting herself up for a three-hour lunch before the QT. <laughs> she's so I'm, done. Look, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm with Maria. Is there any point showing up? At the next meeting. They've already agreed to 50 basis points. Maria, after that, can you talk to us a little bit about QT, how the stage is yeah. set beyond Q1, Q2? Well, I mean, remember they had said this was the early uh, QT to appease uh, some of the hawks in, in the governing council who were saying inflation, obviously, we have to uh, tackle this head on. That means obviously the hikes, but also drain some of the extra liquidity. She may go into that in the press conference. What I want to know, having said that in this press conference, it's very clear we're now going back to back 50 basis points. But what is the rationale for it, uh, Jonathan? Because this week we had a string of data. And to me, the best way to to describe it is cloudy. We had headline inflation go down, but that's back to energy. Core inflation is sticky. When you look at GDP, the debate on recession is still out. So now what I want to see is, is the details, but in many ways, guys, this statement, everything is out. I mean, it, well, you want to play the press conference? That's great. I can stay late, but everything you <laughs> need to know it's already out. Hey, Maria, thank you. Maria Tadeo, I'll take the news conference. We'll take the news conference in about 20 minutes' time. Ibrahim Rakbari joins us now, Chief Currency Strategist at City. Ibrahim, there's a meeting at the ECB at March 16th. They're telling us they're data dependent. At the same time, they tell us they've got another 50. What do you make of this? I actually think the March meeting is going to be really interesting for the ECB, and it was Chair Powell that made it that interesting. Uh, so when you look at the market reaction today, I think what they're telling us is that string of hawkish central bank meetings is over. And the market was surprised very much yesterday. Uh, you saw that in the reaction. And what we're seeing today is telling us in March, we won't be surprised uh, by a similar, I think people call it pivot by the ECB in March. And I'll be very curious uh, to see what we hear from President Lagarde. But I would strongly advise her to be a bit more like Powell and stop guiding too strongly uh, about intentions from here because the ECB too has gone a long way. And as your colleague just said, the data actually come in pretty cloudy uh, of late, even in the Eurozone. Ibrahim, are we coming up with a narrative to fit the flows that are going on in markets right now? So I do think the price action we've seen since the beginning of the year is very strongly flow driven. Obviously, a number of things have fallen into place fundamentally too. China reopening a degree of disinflation, but particularly when it comes to the performance of risk assets and particularly the riskiest of risk assets, that's really because there is so much cash on the sidelines and there had been that underpositioning in these assets. So there is a big flow element to the price action we've seen yesterday, but really throughout this year so far. Abraham, what's the dollar going to do on this? We're getting lots of research notes that market's clear, we get clarity, we move on to a lesser volatility. Does that put new legs to an ever weaker dollar? So we do think that that a string of dollar weakness has, has further to go. And uh, we think that's particularly evident still in the areas of the market that benefit from lower rates and lower rates volatility. So that's carry trades, EM, uh, areas that have uh, seen large outflows uh, over the last few years. 
Within G10 in the currency spectrum, that's probably the yen. In, in yen, it's the Mexican peso that tends to be most strongly related to, to US rates. But if you put these things together, it does tell you the dollar probably still has a little bit uh, further uh, to go. But I would also mention, uh, Chair Powell used to say, be humble and nimble. We're still going to be in a, in, a, in a very challenging environment this year. So I don't think we're going to see the dollar straight down, uh, down in a straight line. I think it'll go down from here, and then we'll reevaluate over the next couple of months as that soft landing debate continues. Ibrahim, this was great. It's just fantastic to catch up with you, and I'm sorry this was so short as we work through the ECB rate decision. Ibrahim Rakhmari there of Citigroup. Just to see these two lines in the same statement from the ECB, the Governing Council intends to raise interest rates by another 50 basis points at its next meeting, and then a few lines later, in any event, the Governing Council's future policy rate decisions will be continued to be denser dependent. I guess what they'll lean on, Tom, is that word intends. We intend to. It will still be data dependent, but no one's going to buy that. This market's just saying 50 and done in March, and then we'll see. For our American audience, I'm going to cut them some major slack. The Fed enjoys a modernity back to the 50s and William McChesney Martin. The Bank of England does not, John. The ECB certainly does not. This is not their first crisis, but they're making it up as they go. And I would suggest Lagarde is really making it up as she goes. I would also suggest that markets are making it up as they go, because they're interpreting this as dovish because they see the, the uh, incoming data as disinflationary. But, you know, other people might say it's kind of neutral. They're just kind of not really taking a strong stance. Let's wait for the news conference. 20 minutes away with the ECB. Up next, hold a meeting of Berenberg. And up next, a little bit of data. Are we going to catch up with Mike? I think we are. Yeah. Mike McKee, down in Washington. Oh, Very cool. From New York, equities rallying. That continues. This is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes away from the up and in bell, equity futures up another six or seven tenths of one percent on the S and P. This rally continues. We add some more weight to it on the Nasdaq, up by more than one percent an hour away from the up and in bell. Looking for some economic data in America. Looking for jobless claims just seconds away. Going into jobless claims, we just had the ECB hike fifty basis points. The Bank of England as well, and these central banks in this hawkishness starting to look a little bit exhausted. That news conference starts in about fifteen minutes with President Lagarde. We'll get to that in a moment with jobless claims and just a wow number and a whole lot more. Here's Mike McKee. Good morning, John. And the conundrum that is jobless claims continues this morning. As last week, only 183,000 were registered. That's down from 186,000, the initial print last month, uh, last week rather, and uh, significantly lower than what was forecast by the markets. We're looking at continuing claims that are also lower, 1,655,000 last month, uh, 1,675,000. So it doesn't look on the layoff side on the losing a job side like the economy is slowing down at all and it's going to be very interesting to see tomorrow oh, sure. when we get the payrolls report whether companies are still trying to add or just hoard workers or uh, whether all of this is pushing up average hourly earnings unit labor costs do come down significantly uh, two percent in Nova, uh, in the third quarter 1.1 percent in the fourth quarter so that also plays into the Powell narrative that things are getting better productivity up three percent after a revised 1.4 percent in the third quarter and this is if you ask an economist uh, about uh, inflation and about the way things could improve this is the best way through increased productivity so you're getting more per worker and if that holds then uh, the fed might indeed be on the way to a soft landing i might thank you i guess the key phrase there if that holds equity futures they like what they see up by three quarters of one percent on the S&P and the bond market, the rally continues on the two-year yields Hi. drop by six basis points, just about holding on to 4% here at 4.0486%, Tom, on a two-year. Can I stir the toxic brew you of can go Washington for it, buddy. economics? Go for it. Did Powell know these numbers? Well, if he did, then his message makes even less sense. Basically, everyone's saying, look at the data to show disinflation, to show an ongoing weakness. Is Mike, these look are, at the data. These are really, it's really strong. These are really important numbers. As Mike nailed, and only Mike McKee can do that, productivity is a stunner with a good revision of 1.4%. Uh, and the unit labor cost is, frankly, yeah. more important than claims. Well, let's get Mike back into it. And hopefully he's still there down in Washington. Mike, how will the Fed think about that 183 
and how does it influence your thinking in any way, shape or form about what we might get tomorrow morning on payrolls? Well, it slightly adds to the idea that the payrolls number may be a little stronger than we anticipated, or at least that the market is anticipating. It's kind of hard to tell because uh, we don't know whether any kind of um, weakness is because companies aren't hiring anymore because they filled all the jobs, or whether it's because they can't find employees. And we know, for example, that restaurants and bars are still having a lot of trouble finding people. So uh, that's going to be something to tease out tomorrow. But it's the average hourly earnings that are going to matter. Uh, are companies having to pay up more to get people to come to work? I, I can answer your question, Tom. No, the Fed did not know these numbers in advance. Oh, come uh, on. Although it was a good. It was a good script. Come on, Mike. <laughs> Go with, with the story. With We're the making it up. the productivity numbers, of course. Um, uh, you know, here at Bloomberg uh, Surveillance, uh, we have the motto: "There is no math." But at the Fed, there's a lot of math, and they can they can uh, parse out the uh, productivity numbers. So I think they probably had a, a pretty good idea that things lo looked good on that. But I think overall, it just continues the narrative. Jobless claims aren't that important to the Fed in terms of uh, what their policy is going to be, but it is an indicator that is not flashing red at this point. Hey, Mike, this was great. Thank you, sir. As always, tremendous coverage from Mike McKee on the Fed yesterday, on the data this morning, and on payrolls tomorrow. That's still to come. Equity futures up 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. Talked about that rally in equities, that rally in bonds as well, to see the two-year yield down another six basis points. Helped out by the ECB. Maybe. I'm going to throw maybe out there. Yes. There is a wonderful yes. phrase that Steve Englander of Standard Charter just pinged me this message on the IB on the Bloomberg Never Terminal. Never messages me. I've asked his permission to share it. He's offered his permission <laughs> to share it. So here it is. To me, it seems that the FOMC has shifted from unconditional hawkishness to conditional hawkishness. And I think maybe that same phrase applies like that. to the ECB this morning, that they've shifted from unconditional hawkishness to conditional hawkishness. Yeah. And that is a highly data-dependent <clears throat> approach. Yeah, Englander is going all Bayesian on us, and I'm not going to go there because I never really believed in it. But this is important, John. This idea of conditionality means, guess what? They're going to give in and look at the data. OK, but they were looking at the data before. Is that justification for markets to rip further, right? I mean, yes, we know that there is some uh, order of disinflation. We know I... this. And the market is responding to the unit labor costs more than uh, continuing claims or initial jobless claims. Is this enough to indicate incredible strength in earnings that have not delivered? On conditionality, I would really like to talk to William Dudley right now, the former head of the New York Fed. I would really, really like to know his thoughts on what we've observed from these three banks. Look, markets, as you know, they care about change. They care about change, and the approach of the central bank has changed. It's, you know, bottom line, that's it. It's changed. Now, ultimately, once you've shifted past that, we can start thinking about right. the data and all those things. But this Fed has shifted. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier this morning. The Fed has gone from a put to a call, and yesterday they did away with the Fed call. And I think that's what Steve's implying with that site, with that language, that phrase. We've gone away from unconditional hawkishness. I don't care what you think. I don't care what your forecasts are. I don't care where the data is yep. right now. We can't deal with CPI where it is. We're hawkish. Financial conditions need to be tight. That has changed. And as someone said to me yesterday, arguably that started with the Brookings conversation a couple of months ago. Things started to come into more balance for them. And I think, I wonder if the ECB is going in the same direction. I don't know. We're going to find out from the garden in about nine minutes. I think that's perfectly said. Honestly, I think that you framed that really well. I mean, this idea of no. there has been a shift and the market's reflecting that. What I'm going to frame is this data screen looks like a follow-on from 3 o'clock yesterday. That's continued. I mean, it's just con it wasn't true two hours ago, but with these two banks, it is continued. Before we move on, I just, you know, Lisa's point is really important. You've had that change. That's kind of happened now. Now it's about the data. Payrolls, <clears throat> CPI. Let's see if the labor market ends up looking like the right. ISMs right now, because then you can have a very different market. Because of time and to get to Lagarde, we're going to really hustle here. And we are so thrilled to bring you to someone truly expert on the political economics and fabric of Europe. Holger Schmieding joins us, chief economist of Berenberg. Holger, I'm going to go to one brilliant sentence in your note. Thank you, France. Thank you, Spain. You made real clear the lift that provides comfort to institutions in Europe as France and Spain are leading the way away from recession. Does that have legs? Can it continue? Yes, I do think it does have legs. What we are seeing is that Europe as a whole is not falling into a winter recession, but in what you could call a winter stagnation, 
Germany, most exposed to Russia, is having a contraction in its GDP. But some of the other countries, especially France and Spain, are making up for that. They are not as exposed to Russia as Germany and not as exposed to some downturn or weakness in global trade at the moment. And this is, of course, good news that the region, Europe, which really last year was the focus of all the bad news, war in Europe, energy shock, that Europe is now actually outperforming expectations. Holger, do you think that in the ECB press conference, uh, Madame Lagarde should push back on the market activity perhaps more aggressively than Jay Powell did yesterday? That is quite possible. After all, the ECB has de facto pre-announced they're going to do another 50 basis points in March. Thereafter, however, they will re-evaluate their approach. So that leaves the door wide open to going just up 25 basis points in May. And beyond that, we'll have to see. The press conference may provide some clues, but probably the ECB has not made up its mind yet on what happens after March. So Lagarde probably cannot give us clear guidance relative to the Fed. What is clear, the ECB, having started later, still has some more room to go to the upside than the Fed from where we are now. Olga, sufficiently restrictive was this phrase that we heard a lot in December. Do you think we are now? Well, my personal view is we are sufficiently restrictive, but I'm fairly certain this is not the ECB's majority view. So the majority on the council will want to go further 50 basis points in March and at least 25 basis points in May with the risk that they could do more. But as we have seen, for instance, in the January data on Eurozone inflation coming down sharply and more good news in the pipeline for March and April, it probably does not take the ECB to go much further to get inflation back better under control. Oh, well, can I squeeze this in just quickly? What happened to German CPI this week and how much can we actually read into the Eurozone CPI data? Well, the Eurozone CPI data may be revised significantly because simply for Germany, there is a change in the methodology and apparently the stats office was not ready and is not ready to apply that in time. The German data could be weird and raise the Eurozone first estimate somewhat. What happened to German efficiency, Holger? What happened to that? Everyone looking down the Very good the UK. question. Hey. We probably really? have a lack of shortage of qualified staff in many places, including some specific <laughs> office possibly. If that's okay, all you can you. claim to. <laughs> 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 hey, good usually luck. they're so efficient. I know. So, yeah, right? You're is, telling me the is... Germans weren't ready for a change in methodology? Yeah, really? <laughs> you're going to really put this out there, this battle between the UK and Germany shocking. with efficient? Shocking. Efficient. Sam, what happened to know. German efficiency? It's gone. I mean, it's it, it actually on the back. The, 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 I mean, I mean, come on, Lisa, help us here. You were at Mercedes. What happened? You know, it was completely efficient. It was completely. I'm sure, I'm sure it was very slick. There. <laughs> I think the, tra the trains were completely efficient. Everything's on time. It's all neat, and everything is working according to rule. Nothing well, well that's nice. the way it's been at Bridgewater here for years. We're going to pause here before we get to Christine Lagarde with Shanali Basic. On, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll not mince words uh, with all due respect to Bridgewater. I'm absolutely baffled by their third co-chief investment officer. Tell us about Karen. It, it really is an amazing story. You had Ray Dalio, remember, stepping down as co-chief investment officer just about four months ago. Now this is the post-Dalio era. It is a 37-year-old first woman to lead this uh, post, co-CIO, at the world's largest hedge fund. It's a pretty remarkable rise. She joined right out of college, and it's at a very challenging well, time. I, for I, I don't buy this for a minute. She's out of Princeton. I get it in public policy. She's a co-chief investment officer, like as compared to Rebecca Patterson, what is her investment abilities? Well, it's interesting. She, kind of like Nir Bardea, the co-CEO, had come out of the research world. So this is a big win for research across the, across Wall Street. And so she came in in 2006, right before 2008. She worked closely with Jack, Greg Jensen, Bob Prince, and Ray Dalio in 2008, within two years of college to navigate the financial crisis. Uh, well, she was most recently sustainability. That's a role she took over in 2021. Okay. And she helped launch uh, new funds in the wake of the war in Ukraine to capitalize on this energy transition. But I want to be clear, you know, she doesn't just focus on sustainability. And her and her co-CIOs have really been hinging on this idea of a 1970s era world that we're going to live in now. Let's see how that helps Bridgewater navigate this year. Now, the culture there is unique. Three co-CIOs 
sounds somewhat unique. How's this going to work? <laughs> well, they've had co three coseos. It does sound like a crowded room, you doesn't think? it, with three people there. But I do want to reiterate that Greg Jensen is the one that recruited her out of Princeton. So it's not like they're all new to each other. And so she's worked there for her entire career under the tutelage. And they're squeezing out Prince. Is that what they're doing? What the street wants to know right now is, are Prince and Jensen retiring? You know, about Prince Dale once, knows, I had so, so, read, so. had told her that he can see her taking his job one day. And oh, in theory, actually, this is kind of the post that Dalio held, too. All right. So we just have a couple of minutes here until the ECB press conference. You talked about the 1970s kind of scenario. How are they shifting their methodologies in a shifting macroeconomic backdrop? Yeah, it's a great question, because remember that you had Bridgewater really on a run on a historic tear for the first nine months of last year. The last couple of months really started to mute some of their performance. They still ended up at their levered Pure Alpha Fund, the Pure Alpha 2, up 9.5 percent. But remember, it's competitive in the hedge fund world. I just got back from Miami Hedge Fund Week, oh, did where you? I did last night. We're it's not as fun as New York down. City in many ways, Tom. Trust me. <laughs> um, though it's controversial there, but they're all preparing for doomsday. Everyone from Paul Singer to Jim Chano. So it's a very different view than what you're hearing from a lot of this optimism that I walked into today, and <laughs> this idea of a dovish Fed. Yeah, when you walk the in markets. the surveillance set, it's very <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> No question about that. It sounds like Shanali's been hanging out with Talib, don't you think? Isn't yeah, that what it sounds I, like? I, I think so, you know. Talib, Jim Chain, literally everybody's singing sad songs down there, but perhaps, I guess that's their job. Well, perhaps the sad songs is the reason why you're seeing such a rip-roaring rally. It's because they're all getting kind so of the, stomped the out of the went down to Miami. Is, the can, can, can we get <laughs> to the news out. that we need? Is Bridgewater moving to Florida? That's all that we want to know. I wouldn't be shocked if they, like many other people, started to put an outpost out there. My manager has asked me to get there and asked me if Miami was real. And it <laughs> turns out it kind of is. Uh, lots of companies from Blackstone. People were very excited about Blackstone's presence down there. Uh, lots of people moving down. Uh, another firm told me that people are rotating desks because there's not enough room for the demand. They yeah. have to raise pay to bring people down there, a lot of people, because the prices are so high. Surveillance from the deck of the bets at Miami Beach. I can see it. <laughs> is Miami real? It's different Miami. Some of Miami is real and some okay. is not. Is that okay. a bigger I statement? I don't know what that means. Well, have you ever walked on the beach? Never mind. Okay. Shani, thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank is it what oh, you think the beach is a fake? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I, I think it's just you know, is it truly a destination? You know? Oh right. Right. Do, do they yeah. are they just sort of registered there and not living there? Exactly. Like, okay. is it, no, is I think it, people or, choose to live there. I think I'm people fairly, do. Fairly confident I think, of that. I think it's they weren't all nice. actors. I wasn't in the Truman Show when I was down there. <laughs> <laughs> are we just in the Truman Show? Is I, that what we're doing? I think this feels like it's sometimes. No, but the, the, <laughs> seriously, John Miller is great on this, but there's there's something big going on here, whether it's Texas or Florida. I mean, there we talked about the numbers. The net migration, a massive home, migration, without a doubt. I mean, it's tangible. It's it's different this time. I remember, like when air conditioning clicked in the South, woke up, Atlanta woke up, and all that. <laughs> no, it's a long time ago. I remember when it was not <laughs> like that. that. And then, boom, it happened. And this is a new. Do you think this is the conversation they have at the Phoenix. ECB? Do you think President Lagarde's sitting <laughs> why, there saying, does, "We should take radio, we should take HQ down to the south of France." Yeah. We should do we should do HQ down, down can, in Cannes. It's be like the Vatican. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we should do it in Cannes. It and then you've got like the Italians the saying, no, no, no. You know, the Pope yeah. moves the Amalfi Coast. Yeah, yeah. oh, I think you're just you talking know? about it's, your vacation plan. Well, I'm just does thinking we, take, we could take the show this? on the road with you. I, I think John, so. Yeah. For, for the ECB, does the Fed need to do this and have photo shots of, of So of what Jay I like Powell about this and what I like about what the Bank of England does, so you're going to see, I can't see quite that. I think the vice president is alongside her. Yeah. And I think this is really good. De Gindos. And I think that this is, um, no, the chief economist could be up there too, but I don't think the chief economist mm -hmm. is there, Tom. But usually it's the, the VP. And I think That's this is a good Maria idea. taking photos I, in the front row. I like this. I yes. like having the VP there. I'd like to see Chairman Power, the vice chair, alongside him too. I, I, I like this idea. tradition at the Bank of England, likewise at the ECB. What do you make of the podiums? What do you think of that? I, um, I love them. Yes. You know, I like him. I think that Madame appealing. Lagarde's working out. It looks like TV. It looks like you know TV twenty four, whatever it is in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> looks good. I like Van Cat. Like <laughs> Van, Van, Van Cat. Like whatever it is. I like the color scheme. That's <laughs> very French. I think we're done. That's the Gindos. All right. That's not <laughs> Philip Lane. Just to clear that up. The ECB president Christine Lagarde about to speak in Frankfurt, Germany. I keep saying this. We show so much respect to the Fed. And it's the ECB and the Bank of England. It's joke time. Oh, he was growling okay. earlier. Hold on a second. The the was it was Those what we did yesterday respect? I, mean, I thought it was highly look, respectful. I think that we're respectful of the decisions that they have to make. The ECB president, Christine Lagarde. For those who are um, 
overseas. The Vice President and I welcome you all to the press conference and we would like to begin this press conference by congratulating Croatia on joining the Euro area on January 1st, 2023. We also warmly welcome Boris Vujic, the governor of Vatska Narodna Banka, the National Central Bank of Croatia. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting. The Governing Council will stay the course in raising interest rates significantly, at a steady pace, and in keeping them at levels that are sufficiently restrictive to ensure a timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target. Accordingly, the Governing Council today decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points, and we expect to raise them further. In view of the underlying inflation pressures, we intend to raise interest rates by another 50 basis points at our next monetary policy meeting in March, and we will then evaluate the subsequent path of our monetary policy. Keeping interest rates at restrictive levels will over time reduce inflation by dampening demand and will also guard against the risk of a persistent upward shift in inflation expectations. In any event, our future policy, decision, policy rate decisions will continue to be data dependent and follow meeting by meetings approach. The Governing Council today also decided on the modalities for reducing the Eurosystem's holdings of securities under the Asset Purchase Programme. As communicated in December, the Asset Purchase Programme portfolio will decline by 15 billion euros per month, on average, from the beginning of March until the end of June 23. And the subsequent pace of portfolio reduction will be determined over time. Partial reinvestments will be conducted broadly in line with current practices. In particular, the remaining reinvestment amounts will be allocated proportionally to the share of redemptions across each constituent programme of the APP and under the public sector purchase programme to the share of redemptions of each jurisdiction and across national and supranational issues. For our corporate bond purchases, the remaining reinvestments will be tilted more strongly towards issuers with a better climate performance. Without prejudice to our price stability objective, this approach will support the gradual decarbonization of the Eurosystem's corporate bond holdings in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. The decision, decisions taken today are set out in a press release available on our website. The detailed modalities for reducing the APP holdings are described in a separate press release which will be published at 3.45 uh, local time. I will now outline in more details how we see the economy and inflation developing and will then explain our assessment of financial and monetary conditions. So looking at the economic activity first. According to Eurostat's preliminary flash estimate, the euro area economy grew by 0.1% in the fourth quarter of 2022. While above the December Eurosystem staff projections, this outcome means that economic activity has slowed markedly since mid-22, and we expect it to stay weak in the near term. Subdued global activity and high geopolitical uncertainty, especially owing to Russia's unjustified war against Ukraine and its people, 
continue to act as headwinds to euro area growth. Together with high inflation and tighter financing conditions, these headwinds dampen spending and production, especially in the manufacturing sector. However, supply bottlenecks are gradually easing, the supply of gas has become more secure, firms are still working off large order backlogs, and confidence is improving. Moreover, output in the services sector has been holding up, supported by continuing re reopening effects and stronger demand for leisure activities. Rising wages and the recent decline in energy price inflation are also set to ease the loss of purchasing power that many people have experienced owing to high inflation. This, in turn, will support consumption. Overall, the economy has proved more resilient than expected and should recover over the coming quarters. The unemployment rate remained at its historical low of 6.6% in December 2022. However, the rate of, at which jobs are being created may slow and unemployment could rise over the coming quarters. Government support measures to shield the economy from the impact of high energy prices should be temporary, targeted and tailored to preserving incentives to consume less energy. In particular, as the energy crisis becomes less acute, it is important to now start rolling these measures back promptly in line with the fall in energy prices and in a concerted manner. Any such measures falling short of these principles are likely to drive up medium-term inflationary pressures, which would call for a stronger monetary policy response. Moreover, in line with the EU's economic governance framework, fiscal policies should be oriented towards making our economy more productive and gradually bringing down high public debt. Policies to enhance the euro area's supply capacity, especially in the energy sector, can help reduce price pressures in the medium term. To that end, governments should swiftly implement their investment and structural reform plans under the Next Generation EU programme. The reform of the EU's economic governance framework should be concluded rapidly. Turning now to inflation. According to preliminary Eurostat's flash estimate, which has been calculated using Eurostat estimates for Germany, inflation was 8.5% in January. This would be 0.7 percentage point lower than the December figure, with the decline owing mainly to a renewed sharp drop in energy prices. Market-based indicators suggest that energy prices over the coming years will be significantly lower than expected at the time of our last meeting. Food price inflation edged higher to 14.1% as the past surge in the cost of energy and of other inputs for food production is still feeding through to consumer prices. Price pressures remain strong partly because high energy costs are spreading throughout the economy. Inflation excluding energy and food remained at 5.2% in January, with inflation for non-energy industrial goods rising to 6.9% and services inflation declining to 4.2%. Other indicators of underlying inflation are also still high. Government measures to compensate households for high energy prices will dampen inflation in 23, but are expected to raise inflation once they expire. At the same time, the scale of some of these measures depends on the evolution of energy prices 
and their expected contribution to inflation is particularly uncertain. Although supply bottlenecks are gradually easing, their delayed effects are still pushing up goods price inflation. And the same holds true for the lifting of pandemic-related restrictions. While weakening, the effect of pent-up demands is still driving up prices, especially in the services sector. Wages. Wages are growing faster, supported by robust labor markets, with some catch-up to high inflation becoming the main theme in wage negotiations. At the same time, recent data on wage dynamics have been in line with the December Eurosystem staff projections. Most measures of longer-term inflation expectations currently stand at around 2%, but these warrant continued monitoring. Turning to our risk assessment, the risks to the outlook for economic growth have become more balanced. Russia's unjustified war against Ukraine and its people continues to be a significant downside risk to the economy and could again push up the costs of energy and food. There could also be an additional drag on euro area growth if the world economy weakened more sharply than we expect. Moreover, the recovery would face obstacles if the pandemic were to re-intensify and cause renewed supply disruptions.